Folks, you have exactly 12 hours from this very moment that I am speaking. It is now 11.59 a.m. on December 1st. You have exactly 12 hours from the moment that I am saying this to head over to sunsetlakecebede.com and get 30 to 60% off all Sebede products at sunsetlakecebede.com. But more importantly, well, I, I, I think so anyways. Uh, not only is this the biggest sale of the year that they're having, Sunset Lake Sebede and the Majority Report are teaming up to uh, turn what is in the wake of the America's most consumerist holiday into a fundraising opportunity for a great organization. We're talking about uh, GiveWell.org, excuse me, GiveDirectly.org. For every uh, for every ten percent, I'm sorry. For ten percent of every sale at sunsetlakesebede.com for the next twelve hours, only twelve hours left, you get thirty to sixty percent off. Any order that you get with a hundred uh, over a hundred dollars will receive a free uh, jar of Sunset Lake Sebede gummies. It's a forty dollar value. There's no promo code uh, necessary, but here's the deal. 10% of their proceeds will go to givedirectly.org and the majority report will match it. This is an organization that is uh, fights poverty internationally, extreme poverty, by sending cash directly to people living in extreme poverty and allowing them to choose for themselves what is the most efficient way for them to deploy this money. Like I say, the majority report is going to match that 10% donation. As you know, Sunset Lake Sebede, majority employee-owned business, it's been it has donated more than sixteen thousand dollars this year to anti-drug uh, war uh, organizations, to animal shelters, to union strike funds, conservation efforts, food pantries, and refugee resettlement organizations. Uh, you know the products are amazing. That's the reason why I'm so uh, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed today because the uh, Sunset Lake Sebede tincture i took last night that let me sleep uh visit sunsetlakesebede.com take advantage of these discounts and help the majority report raise money for a great organization the sale ends tonight wednesday night december 1st at midnight also got this email uh today and um not sure how to react to it frankly Amanda writes in, my life partner is trying to bypass my 40th to see you in Boston in January. This is just getting out of hand. She's talking about the big live mm -hmm. January 16th in Boston at the Wilbur Theater. January 6th. 10th. We already live. announced that uh, John Benjamin and uh, Larry Murphy will be there. She writes, this is just getting out of hand. Yes, he's an early uh, fan, a large contribution member, but it's my damn birthday. Because of COVID, we didn't celebrate his 40th or our 20-year f anniversary, <laughs> 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 Or countless other celebrations that four kids demand. Now, here we are, ready to celebrate. I turned 40 on January 14th. I decided months ago to run my first marathon in Bermuda. Fortunately, that was canceled, and we are now looking for an alternative to celebrate. Caribbean, all-inclusive adults only? Yes, please, but no. It's a constant effort to redirect our celebrations to Boston, which we live 45 minutes from. Doesn't matter. Uh, playing or Improv Asylum is back in action. He only keeps bringing it up because of your show playing live. I'm over it. I either invite him to watch your show on another weekend or I'm canceling your subscription. This is beginning to be just too much. And then she writes, best regards. But, well, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, look, and she says, uh, Mike's lover, I'm not taking second to you. Listen, Mike, I don't know what to tell you. This is our only time that we're going to be in Boston. You guys are going to have to work this out. But for other people who don't have this type of uh, dilemma, uh, tickets are selling out very quickly. Head to MajorityLive.com to get your ticket for the big live on January 6th. Larry Murphy, John Benjamin will be there. We have one or two other uh, guests to announce, uh, which we will do later in this week. But head over there now. I don't know if there's any more mezzanine seats at all, but balcony's great at the Wilbur Theater. 
All right. Speaking of a live show, let's begin ours now. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Wednesday, December 1st, 2021. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, economist Michael Albert author of his latest no bosses a new economy for a better world meanwhile the supreme court holds oral arguments in a mississippi case that seeks to overturn roe v wade meanwhile the republicans may shut down the government over vaccine mandates Student kills three, injures eight at a Michigan school shooting. Chris Cuomo suspended indefinitely for plotting with his brother, disgraced former governor of New York, to smear sexual harassment accusers. Meanwhile, Mark Meadows agrees to cooperate with the January 6th investigation and has new revelations in his book, that detail how Trump knew he had COVID during his presidential debate. <laughs> Meanwhile, U.S. Yes, looks dude, so good. I've had fine. <laughs> U.S. looks to t- uh, toughen COVID testing requirements for travelers as it becomes clear that Omicron, Omicron, is a cat already out of the bag. Meanwhile, FDA panel half-heartedly endorses the Merck COVID pill. Dr. Oz, he of very dubious medical claims, running for Senate in Pennsylvania as a Republican. Meanwhile, Dickens wins in Atlanta, and a BLM organizer, Social Democrat, or Democratic Socialist, I should say, wins uh, the mayor in a large Atlanta suburb. Leftist Roma Castro wins in Honduras uh, presidential election. That is now official. And lastly, a major anti-vaccine Christian broadcaster, Marcus Lamb, dies at age 64 of COVID. All this and more on today's majority report thanks for joining us ladies and gentlemen glad you could make it here as always emma vigland hello emma hello sam happy hump day oh there you go i always forget i honestly i always forget i forget the both that it's that it's the hump day and that we call it hump day right well i mean get used to it no i'm used to to it. it i just forget okay well um Still reeling from that uh, email that we received, where it's really I'm I, I feel we're I feel, responsible for breaking up a marriage potentially. I mean, it seems like it, or or losing a subscriber. I mean, it, I, I, I imagine or. they'll probably go with that first. Right, right. But it, it's it remains. Yeah, it's kind of fifty fifty. I don't know. Talking a, I'm getting wind of what like uh, John Benjamin and Larry Murphy might be up to at the show, and I don't. It may be worth like. Maybe worth just sort of risking it for that guy, but we'll see. Um, hmm. uh, meanwhile, uh, the government is scheduled to shut down in two days on Friday. Uh, if there is not a continuing resolution passed, there doesn't seem to be any uh, likelihood of a full year budget being passed, of course. Um, there are negotiations ongoing about passing a continuing resolution, but apparently 
there are major elements of the Republican Party that are attempting to shut the government down and leverage the idea of vaccine mandates. There's another federal judge. Uh, this one, I think, was in what, Missouri? Was it Mississippi? Louisiana. Louisiana. Federal judge. Um, which has enjoined the vaccine mandates um, in their uh, circuit as well. That was after the Missouri judge yesterday did the same. This is part of like a 14 state lawsuit about the health care worker vaccine mandate. Yeah, you, uh, it's absurd to want your health care workers uh, to have a um, vaccination against uh, COVID. There's data coming out of Israel. It's very early, so you got to take this uh, with a grain of salt. But to the, um, there's data coming out of Israel which shows that the vaccine does uh, inhibit uh, Omicron, at the very least, in terms of uh, how serious getting infected with that variant is. Um, I don't know that there's much you, you can you could take from it. It's better than early data showing the opposite. That's the only thing I could tell you. It's not conclusive at this point. We're going to need a couple more weeks to find out um, exactly just how uh, effective the vaccine is. But we know that it's uh, certainly effective against the Delta variant, both in terms of catching it and in um, and, and, and the implications of it. Is it 100 percent effective? No. Is it 90 percent effective? No. 60, 70 percent, maybe a little more? Yes. Meanwhile, in uh, D.C., the um, Republican Party is, uh, it's, it's I, I don't even know what to, to say about with them going back and forth with each other. Um, uh, I, you know, it's, it's really just sort of like the, the horrible people versus the marginally more horrible people. Uh, but So Real Housewives of D.C. Y- exactly. Um, however... There are implications for when uh, people like Lauren Boebert, but really, I mean, this is the Republican Party has been at this for a long time. I mean, there's nothing uh, new. They have set the table and have defined, um, uh, really, I mean, the you know, whether it's AOC, but in this instance, it's Ilhan Omar. Um, they have set the table to demonize, um, frankly, women of color uh, who are, and and, and certainly uh, w- women who are uh, Muslims in uh, the Democratic Party. And uh, after Lauren Boebert's most recent attack on Ilhan Omar as being part of the Jihad squad, um, apparently there's some implications. And um, here's Ilhan Omar at a press conference uh, explaining what those implications are. Now, we should say, warning, this is going to be a little bit disturbing because she got a voicemail. There's some language here. I'm going to play you a voicemail that we received hours after I got off the phone with Representative Bobert after she posted her video. We see you, Muslim senator, bitch. We know what you're up to. You're all about taking over the country. Don't worry, there's plenty that will love the opportunity to take you off the face of the fucking earth. Come get it, bitch, you fucking Muslim piece of shit, you jihadist. We know what you are. You're a fucking traitor. You will not live much longer, bitch. I can almost guarantee you that we the people are rising up and you will be tried for a military tribunal and you will be found guilty for those of you who did not hear it very well let me read you what the voicemail says we see you sand and word bitch we know what you are up to You are all about taking over our country. Don't worry. There is plenty that would love the opportunity to take you off the face of this effing earth. Come get it. But you are effing Muslim piece of shit. You are jihadist. We know what you are. You are effing traitor. 
and you will not live any longer. Condemning this should not be a partisan issue. This is about our basic humanity and fundamental rights of religious freedom enshrined in our Constitution. You know what's upsetting, though, is that it's not really a partisan issue right now because Steny Hoyer said to Axios yesterday that they're still just, quote, considering sanctioning. I, I mean, it's it's over. it's so... Um... It, it, it's they were so quicker to sanction Ilhan Omar for saying that the United States and Israel had committed war crimes in passing in one sentence in a statement than they have been likely. I mean, not to obscure who, who the real villains are here, which are the Republicans, but the Democratic leadership in the way that they tried to capitalize on villainizing Ilhan Omar have created this environment and they are complicit in it in many ways. And they're also complicit in not... Um showing the American public the um, the seriousness of this type of stuff. I mean, I don't understand how they think from a political standpoint they're going to achieve anything with January 6th. If the, uh, the, the one of the problems of January 6th, one of the sort of the predicate of why it was so problematic was because you've got people like this who are in that crowd. And if you're Ilhan Omar and you're getting these type of threats, uh, you you have reason to to fear for your life uh, in that instance. Of course. Yeah, I think it's totally justified. People were feared for their life. I think it was gross that people they made fun the of AOC. Idea. Yeah, they right. made people made fun of AOC. Like this is the type of people that they have to worry about. Exactly. And you cannot communicate to the American public that there was any that you're taking this seriously if you don't take it seriously. They're not going to. The American public is not going to get out ahead of the Democratic leadership in responding to this. It's just an absurd, it, it, it is it just a, 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 a I mean, it, it, it's, it's shocking that they're not moving much quicker on this. And eventually, hopefully they will. But, but I it mean, really is- and not just, not, as you say, tying it directly to the Republican Party. They keep doing these like individual, like, oh, Gosar, how could you tweet out that video? And in the proceedings of censuring Gosar, that's when the initial Jihad Squad comment was made. And then round and round it goes. I'm sure there will be another Republican that backs up uh, Boebert here, who who uh, then gets like springboarded into some fundraising apparatus by having her back this is the whole of the republican party and so like focusing on the interpersonal drama between the call that bobert made to omar it does a disservice to the entire thing that you're saying here right which is this is the republican base there's a reason this resonates with people and so the democrats never get out in front of this and then they're gonna you know fall in 2024 and wonder what happened um i i i I, yeah i mean i yeah I, I couldn't agree it's more. It's disgusting. It's like disgusting. Gabby Giffords was like 500 years ago. Yeah, it really is amazing. And, and they lost their shit when uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders was mildly heckled at a restaurant. Just yeah. Give me a break. All right, we got some uh, sponsors uh, before we get to uh, Michael uh, uh, Albert. Um, Oh, this one is uh, one of my dailies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you remember growing up, cereal, one of the best parts of being a kid, mm-hmm. correct? Yes. Then you grow up, you realize full of sugar and a bunch of the garbage you don't want to eat. I personally have been trying to eat better through, well, I've been doing, trying to eat better for quite some time, but uh, all through the, the pandemic, I want to sort of lay off any type of sugary stuff. Healthy breakfast doesn't have to be boring. Magic spoon has the amazing flavors you'll love, but without all the bad stuff. You, 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 one of those people who drinks a lot of protein shakes or has those protein bars, well, you can get your protein before and after workouts or even without having a workout. Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein. That's a lot of protein. And only four net grams of carbs in each serving. Plus, it's only 140 calories a serving. Even better... Keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and low-carb. You can try the variety pack. It's got flavors like cocoa, fruity, frosted, and peanut butter. And my favorite, cinnamon. Cinnamon? Yes. I love the cinnamon. 
and cookies and cream, right? Well, I love the cookies and cream. And also, uh, there was a couple other special flavors they had that I really got into, the pumpkin uh, chai. But that's not important. <laughs> Look, go to magicspoon.com slash majority report for your custom bundle of cereal and try it today. Be sure to use our promo code majority report at checkout. Save five bucks off your order. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product. It's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, the refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt free cereal. Magicspoon.com slash majority report. Use the code majority report. Save $5. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode, my breakfast, and frankly, uh, my kids' breakfast. I, feel, I don't feel bad about giving them uh, that cereal because it's, it's not full of sugar. Meanwhile, uh, one of the things that we do over here at the Majority Report is we sell some merch every now and then. And what powers it? Shopify. You want to scale your business? Shopify is here to help. It's got tools and resources that make it easy for any business to succeed from down the street to around the globe. Shopify powers over 1.7 million businesses, including our merch store, from first sale to full scale. Shopify gives entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for big business. So upstart startups, established businesses alike can sell everywhere and synchronize their online and in-person sales and effortlessly stay informed. With Shopify, you can reach customers online and across social networks with an ever-growing suite of channel integrations and apps, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and more. You can synchronize your online and in-person sales and gain insights as you grow with detailed reporting. It's more than a store. Shopify grows with you. This is possibility, and it's powered by Shopify. I mean, we don't, we don't do, uh, well, I guess we'll do some maybe at, um, at uh, our live show. But uh, Shopify has been really great just selling our merch. Super easy to use for a small, you know, side hustle like that we're doing on the Majority Report uh, for merch. But it also scales to much bigger um, selling stores. Go to Shopify.com slash majority, all lowercase, for a free 14-day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Grow your business with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash majority right now. That's shopify.com slash majority. And lastly, um, I've been eyeing a uh, new dining room table. Not dining room table, you know, like a like where you have dinner. Yeah. My table is now uh, 25 years old. Okay. And uh, the laminate's coming off it. I decided it's time. Laminate? Yep. Oof. Yeah, I'm looking at a nice uh, table over at Joybird. I've been walking by the store over here, actually. Uh, but we Joybird's we're selection. We're not by a store. No, I know. Uh, Joybird's co- selection of customizable furniture and modern home decor lets you bring your unique uh, style into your space. You can choose from over 18,000 customization options or 18,000 browse curated collections to find the perfect piece for your style. With Joybird's uh, protection plan, your upholstery and leather pieces will look as good as new. Always. Joybird is committed to creating quality furniture and a more sustainable future. Pieces are made using responsibly sourced materials free of harmful uh, harmful chemicals. Through partnerships with groups like One Tree Planted, Joybird is helping conservation efforts too. With Joybird, you get quality craftsmanship, stain and scratch resistant fabrics, and limited lifetime warranty. Joybird stands by its quality with their 90-day returns. If it's not everything you hope for, send it back. I'm looking at that table, the Remy. Really pretty stuff uh, at Joybird. I'll give you an update on that. I want to, yeah. Send it to me. I need to get some new furniture. Well, you just go to Joybird. Uh, Uh, Well, you know. Go to Joybird. Create a space that brings you joy with Joybird. Visit joybird.com slash majority and get 35% off your purchase. That's 35% off at joybird.com slash majority. All right, all those um, uh, links will be in the podcast and YouTube description. I want to welcome to the program economist Michael Albert, author of his latest, No Bosses, A New Economy for a Better World. Do we have him? I think so. Oh, I can hear you. There you go. Um, uh, Michael, welcome to the program. I'm here with Emma Viglin. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks so much for coming. Um, And so uh, let's... This is um, 
you know, I think some of some of this might be uh, you might have to explain some of the uh, the language. This is, uh, you know, this is um, um, uh, I don't know how well versed everyone is uh, um, who listens to this uh, program with, with with some of the, 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 the terms here. But this is um, this is essentially your um, uh, blueprint from uh, moving from the type of structure that we have with our economy now to one that is far more uh, participatory, which you call uh, Paracon. W what is Paracon? Well, first, the word just stands for participatory economy. So it's just shorthand for that. Oh. Uh, it's an alternative economic model, I suppose you could call it, or vision, which uh, it means to be an alternative to both what we endure here, capitalism, capitalism. and what used to call itself uh, 20th century socialism. And it has, it's, it's not really a blueprint. Um, it, it, it's more like a scaffold. It is five key elements, which the argument says are needed if a new economy is going to fulfill the values and the aspirations we have. But a great many of the details will emerge from practice and from experience. So a scaffold on which details develop as we go along. Um, if you want, I can, I can you know, describe the, the features. Yeah, I, I want to get to the features, but I first want to get to the undergirding values uh, okay. that um, that that set the table for this that you go through. I mean, you go through um, uh, what you call just in the first chapter alone uh, values for a better world. Um, what what are the values that this um, this scaffolding hopes to um, uh, I guess uh, promote? Promote exactly or make real implement sure. Uh, well. Uh, people have to, people make decisions. In any economy, there are decisions to be made. So the value regarding that that we put forward is called self-management. And the idea is that people should have a say in decisions uh, roughly in proportion to the degree that they're affected by them. So that means that everybody is participating in decision-making and, and with an influence proportionate to the impact on them. A second uh, value that that we think makes sense is that people interact in economies. And so what's our value for people interacting? And the answer is solidarity, which is basically just means that people, that the economy should promote instead of antisociality, instead of people getting ahead at the expense of others, a degree of solidarity. Uh, it should promote empathy. It should create a context in which uh, we have civilized relations instead of what all too often we do have. Another value bears upon the distribution of stuff. How much income do you get? Income is just a claim on the social product. So how much of what society produces are you entitled to? And the usual answer to that question is that you can get income for the property that you own. Uh, we rule that out as having absolutely nothing to do with anything ethically valuable or from the point of view of incentives. Another answer is often that you get income, what you can take basically for bargaining power. If you have more bargaining power, you get more income. That's very typical in our own society. Another version is that you get income for what you contribute to the social product, not what your own thing, you know, you know what you own contributes, but what you by your own activity contribute. And that one has a lot of, um, of supporters who are critical of capitalism, of leftist supporters. I don't support it. I don't uh, believe that if you're born, for example, with uh, you know incredible capacities, uh, Adele's voice, Chomsky's brain, whatever, uh, you should have showered on top of luck in the genetic lottery a great amount of income. I don't see any reason for that. Has, there's no incentive reason. And there's no ethical reason, I believe. So the, with the value that's put forward is equitable remuneration. And what it means is, is that we think people should be rewarded or remunerated for how long they work, for how hard they work, for the onerousness of the conditions under which they work, if they're doing socially valued labor. So you're not rewarded for wasting your time or wasting resources and such. You're, re you're rewarded for doing things that are socially valued, but you're rewarded for duration, intensity, and onerousness. And uh, 
you know, an overarching value, which somehow, which in, in some sense uh, is necessary for those or is made possible by those is classlessness. And the idea there is that the economy shouldn't uh, demarcate uh, constituencies, sectors of the population, um, such that uh, some dominate others, such that for example, in our own society, the owning class, roughly one to two percent, dominates everything. Um, or in the thing called called twentieth century socialism, such that a larger class, about twenty percent, who monopolize empowering circumstances, dominate eighty percent, who whose circumstances are basically disempowering. Um, that's ruled out also if you want to have classlessness. Okay, all right. So let me just uh, let me just go back over that a, a little bit, just so that you sure. know, uh, f f folks can digest it. Because there's, you're um, you're you're essentially um, uh, y you've been out you've been outlining you know sort of uh, circumstances as they exist now and um, some alternates, and then the the alternate that you guys uh, are, are promoting here. Uh, we should just be clear on that. So, um, and and I want to go back through these as 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 we walk through them. Fine. Let's start with the last one first. Okay. So, um, I think everyone understands right now that we do have a situation where we have a a concentration of wealth and 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 uh, a concentration of power within the context of our economy, uh, and and also to some extent, and, and also. Uh, similarly with our politics and and they're not really that distinct of of an animal as it were and you're also saying that in the context of of socialism as it has been i guess practiced up to this point or at least uh and, and theorized that having um a uh, uh you know workers councils for instance are also problematic because you're concentrating the power Instead of in one or two percent of people, maybe in twenty percent of the people. I mean, roughly speaking, right? I mean, yeah. okay. But but there's a clear cut reason for that. In other words, it's not that workers' council caused that; it's that the division of labor causes that. So if you divide up every every economy, is always going to have jobs, okay? And a job is a collection of basically tasks, okay? So if you divide up tasks so that about a fifth of the workforce is doing all of the tasks which convey information, which gives you access to daily decision-making, which increases your confidence and your verbal skills and your connections to others and so on, which is empowering. And four-fifths do work, uh, do tasks, do work that's composed of tasks, which are disempowering, which literally reduce the information at your disposal which literally reduce confidence, reduce ties and connections to others, separate you from access to decision-making, and so on. Then the, the former group, even if you have democracy, so let's say you have workers' councils, and let's say you have democracy in them, or you even try for self-management in them, right? Um, it doesn't matter in one sense. That old division of labor, and this is how institutions work, that old division of labor, by its very logic, by its structure, by its implications for the people in the economy, subverts your desire to be democratic. It subverts your desire for self-management. And 20% start establishing and, and setting the agendas. 20% start doing all the argu arguing about you know, the issues and, and deliberating over them. And 80% are bystanders, and eventually they don't even go to the meetings. And that's what happens in those circumstances. It should sound familiar for our political elections, but that's a different issue. Yeah, and I mean, I think like, but but any, you know, uh, if, if you belong to a co-op uh, supermarket, you can you can sort of see the similar dynamic that's going on there. Um, uh, you know, uh, if, uh, th th there's a certain, and I guess, inevitability is the argument that that is going to happen but you see i don't think it's inevitable at all can, well, I, can under, I tell you a little that, story under that oh yeah that is that is the that's the impression yes i agree okay um but and, let's... and here's uh, i don't know how much time we have I, i'd like to tell you a little a story time. a lot of time okay good um at... so i'm in argentina 20 years ago and there was an economic crisis and the economy was in great you know, was in disarray, and many workplaces were failing, and the owners left, and by and large, so did the 
what I want, so do the members of that 20%. I call that the coordinator class. So, so do the coordinator class. Workers took over. Workers instituted what you described, workers' councils. They uh, instituted democracy for decision-making. They leveled the wages, right? And so I'm in a room with about 50 representatives of workplaces who have done this. And it's about six months, seven months after they've done it. And I'm there to give a talk. And, and we're going around the room at the beginning. And at the beginning, everybody's very excited and, uh, you know, uh, um, enlivened by the fact that they're in a room with people like themselves and they can, you know, the, 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 who have, they haven't met from, cause, cause they're, cause, because they're from around Argentina. So we start going around the room. And the, the mood begins to change as people describe where they're coming from and where they're at. And by the time we get to the seventh person, and it was literally the seventh person, because this is imprinted in my mind, um, the person says, I thought I would never say anything like this. I can't believe I'm going to say this. But maybe Margaret Thatcher was right. Maybe there is no alternative. We took over. We have our councils. We, we implemented democracy, we made the wages fair, and now all the old crap, all the old crap is coming back, I don't know, right? That's what he said. And so I, and, and at this point, and I'm not exaggerating here, there were some people in the room who were sort of crying, right? because their experience was similar. And so we stopped, and I said, um, and that what you mean is the alienation and the the, the sense of indignity and the and the you know the lack of control was all coming back. Yes, and I said, and you feel that's because of human nature. And a number of them nodded, and he said yes. And I said, I want to ask you a question. When you took over, and you instituted democracy and you leveled the wages, did you change the definition of the jobs at all? And at first, he didn't understand the question. And I said, well, did you change the way the jobs were defined, what people were doing? He said, of course not. You know, we have to get the work done. We have to, we have to do what we're here to do in our various workplaces. And I said, well, I don't think it was human nature that caused the problem. I think it was that you maintained the old division of labor. And the old division of labor, by its very nature, right, sort of, imposed the subsequent results and uh, so we talked about it and i do think that's the case i do think that the, that old division of labor caused the people who took the jobs for, that were before the empowered people's jobs were empowered and one last element of this i'm in a factory again argentina same time it's a glass factory and i'm talking to a woman and she's now the chief financial officer, so to speak, of this glass factory. And I asked, well, what, what were you doing before? What were you doing before the, you know, the owner left and you took over? She says, I was working at, and she tells me the, the open furnace that she was working at. And it was just incredible. And she described what she was doing. I probably would have lasted a day, right? And she's doing it day in and day out for years. And, but now she was doing this empowered job. So I said, well, what was the hardest thing to learn in this, in this switch, right? And she didn't want to tell me. She was a little embarrassed, I think. I don't know. And so I said, well, was it, was it to learn accounting concepts? No. Was it to learn how to use the computer? No. Was it to learn how to use spreadsheets? No. And I think I came up with one or two other things to ask her, and then I just gave up, and I said, well, please, you got to tell me. And she said, well... First, I had to learn to read. Jeez. Yeah. So there's an, so that's one answer to the question of, are people not doing empowering things because they're incapable of it? Or is it a social? The other way I answer the question is I say, think back 50 or 60 years. Imagine a big stadium in the United States. Imagine all the surgeons in the United States are in that stadium. Look around. What do you see? And everybody tells me I see white men in the, and I say, so you don't see that many women. You see very few women. Yes. You see very few blacks. Yes. And I say, what was the explanation? And they say the explanation, well, all the surgeons would tell you that it's because the women and the blacks couldn't do it. And I said, and what would a lot of the women and the blacks outside the stadium say? 
And they said, well, a lot of them would have said the same thing um, uh, in, a, in a, you know, not happily, but they might have said the same thing. And I said, and could that have been the explanation? In other words, if it was true that women were incapable of doing empowering things from some genetic reason, or blacks were incapable, would it explain the situation? Answer, yes, it would. But it wasn't the case. It wasn't true. And everybody knows it. And now everybody knows it. And it's exactly the same thing. Working class people are denied and have crushed, just like women and blacks, have crushed the capacities um, that that need to be evidenced and, and welcomed in order for people to participate fully. In, in in that instance in in Argentina, I mean, because I because it's 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 much clearer. Like you know, what would happen if um, everyone's um, uh, was emancipated in terms of pursuing what they want in that stadium with surgeons? You'd have a, a far greater sort of diversity of who's who's a surgeon in that instance. But in those in those uh, um, the companies in Argentina. Like, what does that look like in terms of, and I understand the concept of um, you are, uh, you're working with a structure of the division of labor, which is a, f which has been designed in many respects to disempower uh, people so that, so that the, the managerial structure can also uh, be employed. But what would that look like? Like, what is, if you're slicing up the, the, the labor in a different way? Right. Um, does every one of those workers who are feeling disempowered, are they doing different tasks or how does that, how is well, that new structure imposed if it is like, what, what, what generates that? Well, there's two, two parts to this question, I think, both very good. One part is, well, what's the end result? What does it look like to have a workplace which is classless, basically? That's what we're asking, right? So that's one. And then the second question, which is actually much harder, is, well, what's the transition? What is it? How do you get from where we are to there? But until you have the there in there, you you can't really ask the transition question very sensibly, I don't think. Well, so, well let me just, well, I mean, you yeah. could, you could the, the end could be a function of the process versus... It is. Okay. So... Uh, that, it is very much, because if the process... That is the process of doing what? Of opposing current economics, of opposing capitalism, of trying for a new system. So that's the process we're talking about. If that process is blind to the possibility, or even, the, even seeing that there could be a class that is not owners, that is the new ruling class, a new boss in place of the old boss. If it's blind to that, if it says, look, there's only workers and, and owners, and so if we get rid of owners, we win, then, then it's almost inexorable, I think, that when you get rid of owners, you'll get the new boss in place of the old boss. But suppose instead you're sensitive to this possibility, and so you think that, well, how do you solve it? You, you solve it by having jobs each of which is comparably empowering to the rest. And what does that mean? It doesn't mean everybody does everything. That's ridiculous, okay? So it doesn't mean that. But it does mean, I don't know, people like to use the hospital as an example, I guess, because everybody's been in one at one time or another. So it, it does mean that people don't only do surgery and people don't only clean bedpans. Instead, people do a mix of things. Can you do this overnight? No. But over time, can you attain a situation where your workforce is by its daily activities all prepared to be confident enough and aware enough and have enough information to participate effectively in decision making instead of 80 percent going home? We call that balanced job complexes, and that's one institutional feature of this thing called participatory economics. How do you attain that i mean i'm just thinking about i mean obviously uh not everybody is um uh, capable of doing surgery that's fine that's because okay. there's plenty of other things in the hospital that need to be done that can be empowering besides the surgery but how do you um how is the um how is that a, 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 a well i mean is it assigned i mean or is it developed from you mean the 
Yeah, I mean, like, you know, it's it's one thing to, I mean, and then this is, you know, sort of the, oh. the difficulty here is the limited imagination that we have because we're we're coming out of this this type of yeah. uh, of system. Like, is it every worker sort of says like, oh, here's five choices for me. I'm going to do this one, this no. one, that one, or how does it work? No, imagine a workplace. So in the current version of that workplace, you could almost ask the same question. That is, in the current version of that workplace, you acquire, you apply for a job, right? That's what you do. And um, you, you get hired you, and you have the job. Now, the fact is, you can't apply for a job that is a balanced job. There is no such thing in the workplace. Each and every job is either on the coordinator class side, empowered, or on the working class side, disempowered. So what's the difference? The difference is that in a new workplace, the jobs that you apply for are all balanced, right? So in a, and, and who sets, who, do, who divides up the tasks into the jobs? The workers council. The, the answer to every question, we can short circuit it. <laughs> the answer to every question about who decides What's going on in the workplace? Is the workers' council, of course, in context of the desires of the whole population, but it's basically the workers' council. So the workers' council is deciding. So I was in a workplace called South End Press, where basically what we did, and this was even before participatory economics was well-defined, right? But we sat around and we realized if you had, you know, somebody who, um, was in charge of the finances and somebody who had the best contacts with the authors, they'd run the show, um, whatever else you did, um, even if they didn't own the, the, the business, right? Because we weren't, we were nonprofit. Nobody's going to own it. So we decided that we had to figure out a way to apportion the tasks in South End Press so that they would not cause, even against our will, somebody to be elevated to dominance. It's a relatively small group. And so we, we had everybody doing editorial work and that took care of that part of the problem. We had everybody sharing in things like, you know, taking the mail, answering the phone, et cetera, et cetera. And we had people all doing um, a particular kind of work, like for instance, keeping the books or um, uh, uh, dealing with fulfillment it's in other words fulfilling orders for books um dealing with the design of things dealing with promotion and so on and to a certain extent that, that would change over time but but what we didn't have is you know people cleaning for other people ruling it's not easy to do that inside capitalism you have to have a whole lot of commitment to it and you have to have you have to buck the pressure of the market and buck the pressure of banks that want, you know, to deal with the boss, and so on and so forth. But you can do it. It's possible. But in a full, fully transformed society, and we haven't talked about other elements of this, but in a fully transformed society, it becomes natural. Right now, you don't go into a workplace and apply for a job and ask, how come it's not balanced? Every, no, one, no one expects any such thing, right? Right. In a participatory economy, you go into a workplace, and if, if you were given a list of jobs and one of them was unbalanced, you would say, what the hell is this? Well, then right? this essentially vision eliminate the manager, like the managerial class that has emerged in the, our iteration of global capitalism? Yeah, I call it the coordinator class. Okay. Um, it was originally called, you're right, the professional managerial class, Barbara Ehrenreich and John Ehrenreich uh, a long time ago. Um, and at South End Press, we published their famous essay. And that's what got the ball rolling in some ways. Um, it's You don't eliminate all the tasks. I mean, some of them you eliminate because they're disgusting and worthless. But uh, tons of empowering tasks are necessary and essential. So you don't eliminate the tasks. You just disperse them a little bit more than before so that everybody has an empowering situation. And look at one immediate implication. Right now, with 20% doing empowering and 80% doing disempowering, what, is the, what does the educational system have to do? Well, the, the public school system, the school system literally has to graduate 20% who expect to be dominant, right? And 80% who are prepared to take orders and endure boredom 
And that's what school does for 80% of the students. It, it becomes basically, a, sort, a, sorting, a sorting process as opposed yes. to a fully educating process. Yes, and, and, and it isn't even, it's a debilitating process. I mean, the idea that the school system is to educate, it's not. It's not to educate the 80%. It's to deliver the 80% to the economy prepared to fit. And that means prepared to take orders and to endure boredom. And uh, what, what I, I don't are, know how far afield you want to go, but after the 60s, this became a very conscious policy. In, 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 in how did it manifest itself as, as uh, uh, I'm happy to go far afield? Sure. Okay. After, after the 60s, the other side, not my side, um, looked and said, good Lord, this was a horror show. And we have to figure out what happened and prevent it from happening. And they established something called the Carnegie Commission that basically was investigating. I mean, it's not basically. It was investigating to discern the causes of the 60s. And it wasn't entirely stupid. They came up with one that was quite smart, I think. They said, you know, I mean, it's hard to even voice it. It's so embarrassing. They said we were overeducating people. Right? We were creating a, a set of people graduating from high school and entering college who expected to have a life. And when they encountered the world outside, they were more or less horrified and alienated by it. And many of them did what we saw them do. And uh, I think there's a lot of truth to that. It's not the whole story by any means, but there's a lot of truth to it. But regardless of how true it was, the lesson that they took is that we should jack up the cost of higher education to keep, you know, the rabble out, as no one would describe the, the situation, jack up the cost to keep the rabble out, um, and, and much more, even more so, apportion educational resources to communities in a manner which favored the communities whose family situation was favoring this kind of confidence and this kind of expectation. And they did it. And now in the United States, we have higher education. I mean, it's incredible. Graduate school education in the United States is still very good. I mean, at the better schools. Internationally, it's still very good. But there's an interesting situation, which is that students who graduate from undergraduate education in the United States have a hard time dealing with it. And a, a, and it, a growing proportion of the attendance at the better graduate programs in the United States is actually from overseas. And the reason for that is because so many people are stunted by education rather than flourishing. And even in the 20%, you have the problem of simultaneously giving people some tools and some confidence, but making sure that they that they're disinclined to use those tools and that confidence to challenge the system. So you want them to, you know, be ready to try and socially climb, not be critics. Let's go through some of the other uh, sort of, I guess, um, aspects of, of, of both of, of our economy that would, um, would change or, or that, okay. uh, you know, that, that, um, and, and I'm, and, and let's start with, with uh, private ownership. Um, Gone. And, and okay, and will you right? And but will you also define that uh, for us? Sure. Because it's not, I can't own my. It co doesn't. Right. It doesn't mean that you can't own the shirt that you're wearing. Of course, you own that, and it, it is not the case that I, because I am an avowed advocate of participatory economics, can come into your house and take your shirt. That's nonsense. What it means is, society has stuff that is, we can call it productive assets. It's the stuff with which society produces the social product. And so what is that? In, what is that? Well, it's equipment, lots of equipment of various kinds, venues, like, like buildings, natural resources. It's also the talents and the knowledge uh, that have accumulated over, you know, the technology. It's also that. So instead of having this stuff owned by Bezos and company, um, 
who then use that ownership to dominate outcomes and to accrue, you know, gargantuan, unheard of wealth. Instead of that, we think of that material, that stuff as part of a commons, a productive commons. And that productive commons is there for society to use. However, to use elements of that productive commons, you have to as, uh, effectively, I mean, we'd have to go further to do, to do this, but effectively you have to make a case that you're gonna use it sensibly. In other words, you're not gonna waste it. You're not gonna take natural resources and waste them. You're not gonna take um, equipment and, and uh, factories and so on and waste them. Or, and you're not gonna produce gargantuan amounts that offset the value. You're gonna do socially valued activity. And so what we've done is we've said, let's replace private ownership. Yeah, Bezos doesn't own anything anymore and so on. Uh, let's replace that, not with um, a simple idea that you know the state owns it, um, but with an idea that it's, it's there to be used when it is a responsible, socially valuable use. And that would leave us having to explain, well, how do we determine that? But anyway, that's the criteria. Um, and that's the replacement for uh, private ownership. So uh, how, how did that? Uh, and one last time, final thing. What, remember you asked me about the values? Why, how does the values relate to this? Well, when we were doing this, having settled on self-management and solidarity and uh, diversity and equity, we then simply asked ourselves, what's the implication of, so of private ownership for those? And the answer is, it obliterates them, right? It, it isn't just that it's a slight problem. Private ownership obliterates self-management, it obliterates equity, it obliterates solidarity, and it obliterates diversity. So, so the answer, unless we can't come up with something, we should get rid of that. And so we came up with something. And, and the thing that we came up with is common. That's not an unusual, you know, that's not unique to participatory economics. What do we do with, uh, let's say, just like restaurants? I mean, I'm just, I'm trying to make this down to like a most practical. Uh, uh, um... sure. A restaurant is a workplace, right? If you don't have the owner, then who runs the workplace? Answer the workforce. All right, so the workers' council in the workplace, and, and there's an industry council, an industry of restaurants. But anyway, the, the workers' council in the workplace does it. If you don't get rid of the old division of labor, let's make it a big restaurant so it's more interesting. If you don't get rid of a big divi of, of the old division of labor, some of those workers are going to dominate the rest. Right. That does away with self-management, equity, et cetera. It's, so we don't want that. So we have to figure out an alternative to the division of labor. And so that now we've got balanced jobs that we need if we're serious about our values. I mean, if we don't care, okay. But if we're serious, then you can't retain something that violates them so horrifically. So you get rid of that division of labor. So a, a restaurant or an auto plant, um, electric auto, presumably, anyway, a restaurant or an auto plant, same thing. Workers' council probably work teams, divisions, and so on, making decisions via a self-managed forms of deliberation and tallying of preferences, uh, remuneration for how long you work, how hard you work, and the onerousness of the conditions under which you work. And that is a big change, a very big change. Um, and then, you know, we, we the, the, the most complicated part, I suppose, is the allocation system. Well, yeah, I wanted to talk about that. Sort of the the, the, the there is a an, an ability. I mean, there's uh, uh, in your in this um, uh, scenario, I guess, or this uh, this economy, sure. there aren't necessarily markets, but there are products. Uh, and um, and if I want a product that um, it, I have the ability to to make more money by not necessarily being super skilled at something, but in terms of like exerting a um, easily, relatively quantifiable, more effort or less effort, right? I mean, that's, that's basically that's the- That's correct. Well, you that's just correct. walk through that. I mean, so- Well, it, it, first off, the, the main competitor to that, so to speak, 
is the view that you should get back an income that's that's correlated to proportionate to what you contribute to the social product that's the main competitor most people who are progressive um are not going to say you know you should get profits and they're not going to say you should get what you can take you know that's al capone's economy that's what we have by the way anyway you're not going to say that um so should you get back essentially what you contribute and when some socialists tell me that they believe that, I say to them, do you think that, you know, LeBron James or Steph Curry owning $40 million a year is overpaid or underpaid? And they, of course, say way overpaid. Absolutely. This is ridiculous. And I say, well, no, he's underpaid. By the norm that you just gave us, they're underpaid. Nike takes some of it. The owner of the team takes some of it, the TV networks take some of it, they're not getting all of it, because they don't have enough bargaining power, they're getting what they have the power to take. And so that makes the person think somewhat. And then I would add, well, why should LeBron James get such a high income or Steph Curry, because they were born with these attributes, right? Why, why are we showering wealth upon them on top of that? And uh, yeah, it, it, these are values, you know, they're not, it's not a mathematical proof. I don't like that notion. So we come to this notion that you get for duration, intensity, and onerousness. And the way that looks, I mean, you're asking really good questions, and they take us steadily deeper. <laughs> and um, so let's assume for a minute, that in the economy as a whole, institutions um, say that our workplace should get a certain amount to a portion among its workforce as income. And income is just, I mean, that's the same concept as now, right? You get an income and that income, you use that to get stuff you want from the social, just like now. Um, but you're not operating in a market because there aren't buyers and sellers who are competing. There aren't, um, uh, I don't know how much time you want to spend on markets. Um, markets are rejected because they produce antisociality. They violate solidarity because they literally produce, this is a harder argument, the coordinator class work and class distinction, even without owners. And because they misprice virtually everything. That is to say, markets are supposed to be this fantastic vehicle for societies to sensibly allocate because they're evaluating things well. Well, the truth is, and no economist would deny this, this is an irony here, that markets don't evaluate things well. Markets take into account the will of the buyer and the will of the seller, but they don't take into account, for example, if I'm buying a car, the people who are gonna breathe the fumes from the right. car. Externalities, I stand Externalities ignored. They also, by and large, they don't take into account, for example, unless I have the power to force it, my health as a worker, right? It's irrelevant, right? No, no, that, that only comes into play if a union can force it into play. So it's power, not attention to it. Anyway, the point is that if we say that the allocation system, not markets, right, can tell your factory, the three of us and a bunch of other people, that your factory is entitled to a certain amount. What's that amount going to be? It's going to be the, the number of people times the duration, intensity, and onerousness for each doing socially valued labor. Okay, so let me ask so Then me in turn, one last step. Then inside the workplace, the workers' council is going to apportion that among the workforce. Okay. How, all right, so, um, I mean, to be clear, just going back uh, to, um, you know, the, the LeBron example. Okay. Uh, in that situation, the idea is that, and just to be clear, uh, LeBron's getting, I don't know how much he gets paid, uh, $30 million. Oh, well let's, just, let's, say, let's just say whatever, it's $30, $40 million a year. But he actually generates 
let's say a hundred million dollars worth of, 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 of money by, you know, everybody tuning in and going to the games and this and that. People like it. And he doesn't get, but he doesn't get that other 70 million that goes to the owners, that goes to the TV people, that goes to other people who are basically skimming off of that because, uh, you know, on some. It's also like uh, almost impossible to quantify if he's bringing in that money and the other players are not. We know he necessarily has to be bringing in more than he's getting. Otherwise, there wouldn't be an owner. They wouldn't be doing it. They're, They're all trying to get their cut. True. But, okay, so wh- whatever that figure is, but I'm just trying to say, so in in this uh, new economy, we would basically look at like he's playing 60 minutes a uh, uh, hundred times a year. He's going to practice this amount and every, we're going to allocate based on that number, whatever, there's a formula. Uh, there's how there's a little allocate? more. What he's is, also going to have a balanced job complex. Okay, and he's also he's going to be he's not only going to be playing he's also going to be like you know making sure that the 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 arena is clean or whatever it is everybody's exactly. going to get a piece of that and it's how many hours you put in um, and 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 there'll be a number but how is it determined so and 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 if I put in more hours then I'm going to go get a car or I'm going to get two cars because my family wants two cars as opposed to we want um, a bigger house or we okay. want not more clothes, but how do how does society organize? If there's no markets there, how does society say this is the value that we're going to allocate to a basketball team, or this is the value that we're going to allocate to car production? So there may be five or ten or a hundred uh, different car companies, um, uh, and they're all going to put out cars. But how how do you find that equilibrium if there is no market? Can I can I ask you one question? Do you have any economics background? I don't. You're asking better questions than 90% of economists would ask. And I'm not just saying that for you. It's true. Okay? I mean, you're asking straightforward. All right. So the the answer to that question is you have to have an allocation system, right? And an allocation system is something which, by some fashion, right, uh, uh, accumulates information from consumers and producers, and generates what the economy is going to do, how much of this and that is going to be produced and where it's going to go, and simultaneously prices things. Markets do it by competition um, and get the prices wrong, but they do get prices. And it does function. There's no point in denying that, right? It functions. Uh, Central planning does it by essentially the following. It's as if you send a questionnaire to everybody and you get back some answers. You look at those, you send another questionnaire, you get back some answers, you send orders and you get back obedience. Okay, that's the that's the model of central planning. Um, participatory planning doesn't have a center like that. So what is it? Well, we said we have workers' councils and we also have consumer councils. So you're in your household as a consumer, but you're also in a neighborhood and, and there's a consumer council because a lot of consumption is collective. And then that then there's federations, like there's a federation of workers councils up to an industry, there's a federation of consumers councils up to a county or a state or whatever, because a lot of consumption is collective. In our society, most collective consumption, we don't even know what that it's happening, right? We have no say in it whatsoever. In a participatory economy, you do. Okay, what's going on? What allocation then is, it has to be some kind of a dialogue between workers and consumers, some kind of a conversation uh, in which workers are basically looking at their situation and saying what they want to do. Consumers are basically looking at their situation. This includes sort of an estimate of what you're going to what's going to be your income for the year, because you you know how much you want to work, et cetera. So they're looking at their situation and essentially seeing what they want to consume. This information has to be um, interact. Right. So each side has to ha- hear from the other. And when it hears from the other, it has to modify what it's requesting. And what we want, what we hope for, is it's called an iterative procedure, is a round of such uh, interactions 
in which you arrive at a plan. You arrive at a level of, of, uh, of synchrony between consumption and production that is doable and that you can proceed with. And you arrive at prices, uh, valuations, that are take into account the full individual, social, and ecological costs and benefits. This is ideal. And so if you can do that, and, uh, and then, you know, the remuneration is important because the remuneration affects how that occurs. Um, but the, the case is that this process um, with a, a few um, uh, jobs, right, that facilitate it, um, processing the information so it's readily accessible, uh, de de delivering what are called um, indicative prices, that's guesses as to what the final price will be, right? So in the process, you're hearing indicative prices that represent where we're at in the iterations, right? And then you're reacting to those, and those prices are getting closer and closer to actual true social costs and benefits. And the demands and supplies are getting closer and closer to each other. And with Slack and so on, you arrive at a plan. And so the question becomes, is this possible? Um, a long time ago, actually, around when Robin Hanel and I, who, uh, with whom initially we, this was sort of worked out, uh, were doing it some years earlier, a guy named Alec Nove, who was a socialist, um, wrote a book. And in the book, he said, look, there's markets, there's central planning, and that's it. There's nothing else. That's the way the cookie crumbles. And so you either choose one, you choose the other, or you choose both. And what we were saying is, if that's the way the cookie crumbles, we're in hot water. Because those allocation systems both subvert the values we hold dear um, and produce outcomes of the sort that you see in the United States and you saw in the old Soviet Union. So we, we thought, well, let's not take it as gospel because this, this guy says it. His proof was nothing. His proof was basically, I said so. I mean, I, I mean, literally, you can go I, back and read it for yourself, right? Um, there's no real proof of it. And uh, so we sort of felt like, why? Why is it impossible to have not um, just an individual buyer and seller being oblivious to everything else competing or a planner and everybody else obeying? Why is it impossible to have the producers and the consumers have a process which is facilitated by structures and which lets them exchange their information and arrive at a plan? If a plan, by the way, isn't like a binding decision over the course of a year it certainly changes circumstances change there's a hurricane whatever all sorts of things can happen taste can change right so you have to be able to keep updating it also uh, the, the claim is no bosses presents it um that's the book i guess you know that, that got me on here right um, uh, <laughs> so no bosses presents a description of this process in more detail than we can do right now and there are other presentations um uh, that do so as well. I guess what I would say for your audience is this, um, nothing that I've said should cause you to jump up and say, I'm a participatory economy advocate, right? At, but what I would hope it would do is cause you to say, hell, I hope he's right. I hope it really is possible to have an, an economy in which there's dignity for everybody. There's equity for all. People control their own lives. I hope that's possible. And this guy is saying that, that a, a structure and, a, and a, just a few defining pieces, five defining pieces, make the case. I want to look for myself um, and think this through. I, I hope people will say that. And that's how the book's written. It's not written for economy. You know, it's not written in some arcane language. Uh, you have to spend a little while thinking through things because they're so foreign. But it's not rocket science. It's it's not biochemistry or quantum mechanics. It's real life stuff that we are all familiar with. 
Well, we will put a, a link to No Bosses, a uh, new economy for a better world. It is, um, it is. Uh, uh, I never thought I would say this, but it's a third way that I can get behind. <laughs> There's a third way, that's true. <laughs> uh, 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 economist uh, Michael Albert, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Like I say, we'll put a link uh, to uh, No Bosses uh, in our podcast and our YouTube descriptions. I thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. And I, I, I meant what I said. Um, uh, I, I, you don't need to hear this, but it, it's, let me give you one. I was once in Turkey and I was on a show like this and it was a, um, except that it wasn't like this because it wasn't, it was a key figure in Turkish media, you know, like Dan Rather type level of, of figure, um, not radical at all. And I was flabbergasted by how good his questions were and how this was a long time ago after a prior book. And when I came back, I, I asked Chomsky about it because we're friends. And he said, it's not surprising. Um, in the United States, the need to, to, to be sure that powerful media figures are in line and that's that's people on NBC and ABC who are, you know, TV, um, whatever you call them, uh, you know, the people on the screen, the sure. okay. America, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the need is so great to be sure that they don't step outside the norms, right? Um, during the Vietnam War, there isn't a single instance, not one instance of a main newspaper not a radical one, but a main newspaper or a main TV report or a main radio report that said U.S. invasion of Vietnam. The phrase could not be uttered. Hmm. And the people didn't utter it, not because somebody was there to be sure that if they uttered it, they were fired. They couldn't utter it because they couldn't think the thought. They literally couldn't think of the thought. And so Noam's point was, look, in Turkey, they don't have to do that. And this guy, ha this guy thinks he hasn't been so socialized and so battered by the process of climbing the ladder in the Turkish media that he no longer can think those thoughts. Um, but people in American media, by and large, are uh, who rise to the top and and. And that's why things like the majority report is so important. Well, I like to think we're doing uh, we're doing okay around here, but uh, yeah. I, <laughs> I yeah. appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much Thank for coming. You. All right. Thank you. All right, folks. We're gonna head into the uh, fun half. He doesn't realize we're so washed in Comcast money. <laughs> I, I know, right? And anything. Google money. And Google and uh, Comcast money. I didn't want to say anything, but um... <laughs> folks. It's your support that makes this show possible. And of course, the Google and Comcast uh, money that we're Thank drowning you, in. Thank you, Google and Comcast. Um, members, you're okay too. Yes. And it's, uh, it is our members that make this possible. You can become a member today at jointhemajorityreport.com. Don't forget, Majority Live, January 16th. The big live. The big live, yeah. Um, you can uh, go to majoritylive.com, get your tickets. Better do it quick. Uh, we're, we're breaking up families around here. Broken family. Why'd you folks break up? Because of the majority report. Right. Because of the majority live show. Um, check that out. Also, don't forget, we got some merch. If you want to buy a Christmas present, shop.majorityreportradio.com. Or I guess a late Hanukkah present. Yeah, right. You don't have to get it quick. You could put a you could have put a picture of it. That's sometimes what you do. Or a birthday present. Who or knows? a birthday present. Matt, what's happening in the Matt Leckian media universe? Uh, yeah, tonight we got Paul Prescott. He was a Jacobin contributor. Now he's running for the eighth uh, state senate district in Pennsylvania. We're going to be talking to him about uh, labor and progressive uh, organizing, as well as uh, why Democratic voters shouldn't accept pro charter school uh, uh, candidates and uh, how we can organized for uh, green jobs so that's tonight uh, patreon.com slash left reckoning to get the post game folks see you in the fun half six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty we'll be taking your calls and getting your ims which you can get uh, you can im us through our app at majorityapp.com see you in the fun half left is best jamie and 
I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> Some good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight, fifty-six, twenty-seven, one half, five, eight, three point nine billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd, don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grandpa. I had my first post coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, gonna take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. <laughs> What you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> Ooh. Wow. Um, but damn, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. Um, some really interesting, uh, the phone lines are open, 646-257-3920. We got two uh, interesting uh, comments I just happened to see on the IM. Uh, one is the participatory system. This is from Nell Flow. The participatory system described by the guest sounds extremely complicated to be effectively implemented at scale. One major drawback I can see is that if there is no competitive system to assign prices, Price differences due to quality differences would need to be calculated by the committees described, which sound difficult to do for abstract products like food quality, entertainment, or art. If quality is not rewarded, workers would just do the bare minimum to earn their effort-based wages, and so the quality of products would go down because there would be no incentive to do better. These kind of kinks would need to be ironed out before such a system could work. Still interesting ideas for having the guest on. And somebody else wrote in, Amos, which I think is a similar critique. Not sure anyone would go to an NBA game where LeBron is serving popcorn and I'm playing basketball, but as always, love the interview and the conversation. Um, I um, I think we would have to, I, I think that would be a second hour um, uh, a question. I mean, I, uh, Bear at Home 2 says, Sam, what was your honest opinion of what your guest was espousing? I think it's really, uh, I think it's an interesting concept and I think it's really, I don't know how you get from here to there. I just don't know how that happens. But I think it's really important to um, to think about such things. I mean, it's almost it's like, useful as a mental exercise. I, I mean, but but not just for the sake of the exercise itself. I mean, it is you know, um, it, it, it seems to me that it it's a nice um, a pairing 
with um, the the dawn of uh, of everything, insofar as it like sort of expands your understanding of what is possible. And there are, I, I do think there there is. Um, I don't know how you get from here to there, and I don't know how you address that issue of of specific quality. Although I'm also not a hundred percent convinced that that matters. <laughs> like, right. Like, I mean, it matters to us now, but if we had the opportunity, you know, because, you know, presumably like I, if I have a really nice shirt, I'm going to feel better uh, as opposed to like a decent shirt. But, you know, I'm not convinced that if I didn't have to, uh, you know, if my life was structured in a different way, maybe I wouldn't rely on the quality of the shirt for the quality of my life. Um, it, it's, it's hard to conceive of the, of the whole system, um, of what it would be like if the whole system changes. So I, I I'm, I'm open to it. I mean, uh, and you know, I mean, I, I, this is, I, I, like I say, I don't know how you get from there to, from here to there. Uh, but I do think it addresses what for me is always one of my, um, concerns about, and and I, I still don't know exactly like what the origin sort of story is for setting up these um, processes because I don't know how you ever escape having that um, uh, what did he call it the coordinating class like I mean at one at one well, what the the one that that was what I asked about the managerial class yes a, I mean at one I, point someone's got to set that up and I don't know how like. the the process to set this up how you escape the coordinating class from existing within the context of that process too i mean that's the but but um they can just team up with the automated class right it'll all be automated well how you get the liberals on board (laughs) there we uh we just got to build the proper algorithm but yeah right uh, exactly i mean i i'm I was uh, the, the the distinction from Mar- the the distinction from Marxism was look I don't have the theoretical language to like fully keep up but I I I, I didn't fully grasp wh- why that was so important. Which was what that it was ju- it's just I, there there seemed to be you know he 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 resisted overlapping with Marxist definitions. And had new like empowering workers basically that um locks in a class system i think is the simple version of his argument yes that there's a certain inevitability that it once you do that that it's uh, this this dynamic is always going to arise unless you create the structures to specifically okay so he was kind of addressing and, and, that at the outset and that's where marxism gets hazy itself because like marx ultimately thinks that we sh- the state should wither away and we should get achieve a class of society but what does that what does that actually look like um is you know a, same, same question we're asking now um let's see here uh bear with me one second please uh somebody had wanted to, to call in to i don't know have God. Do you what what do, do you remember what that area code was, uh, uh, Bradley? Okay, you keep your eye open for. It. I don't know if that person's going to call in, but um, somebody wanted to have. Um, I don't know what it was that they wanted to debate me about, but I. Ooh. And people know how I feel about that. Uh, call from a three eight six area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hello, is this me? Yes, it is. Hello, my name is Matej. I'm calling from Slovenia. Where are you calling from? Slovenia. Slovenia? Europe. Oh, hi. How are you? I'm Matej. Hey. What's on your mind? First, first time calling. Oh, I wanted to talk about taxation policies in Europe, how they differ to like the United States. So I'm, I'm a bit of a geek, so I was checking up with the data on taxation. Like basically, what's the majority uh income for governments like what kind of taxes and i found a big discrepancy where you guys get a lot of your a lot of your income from uh from like income taxes and here we have a pretty high consumption taxes right the vat like, right is that a vat tax? yeah we have the vat 
but there's a lot of like like how do you call it uh, fuel taxes you know you got uh sales tax every energy is basically yeah sales tax but you got a lot of different taxes that um uh collect um i don't know basically 50 percent of our taxes come from consumption taxes and you guys only do like eight or ten percent and when uh people talk about you know oh we have to tax the rich and all the stuff you know um it's not gonna do it you know because they're, they're always gonna avoid paying taxes i think the best way to increase income for governments is to just have broad taxation of everything and then redistribute that wealth instead of talking about oh yeah we need to put a uh, tax on billionaires and stuff like that yes well the issue is gonna find some loophole the issue is is that those taxes so say a sales tax i'm not sure if it's the same in slovenia but it's regressive because it applies for people who have lower income they're paying a higher proportion relative to their income than somebody who has a ton of money buying the same product yeah yeah, yeah that's true but that's why we have pretty good social system well that is that money see, gets this is this back. is the this is the the dilemma there's two there's two things um one i don't necessarily think that it, this is a question of for for at least in the context of the United States, because of the nature of our currency, that we're taxing so that we can spend. I, I just don't think that's actually the case at this point, but uh, put that aside for a moment. Um, you have the regressive nature, and we do not have the social safety system <laughs> that, uh, m you know, makes the, you know, the, the, a, a consumption tax um, you know, sort of more oriented towards what we would consider sort of like um, a high end, you know, or a luxury spending. I don't know what, uh, how else you would, you would, you would, uh, you know, uh, categorize that. But the other, the other uh, problem is, is that um, we have a problem with a, a, an enormous amount of, of wealth inequality, which ends up being a, a, a political inequality. And the reason why, me personally, I want to tax the rich has less to do with getting revenue for our government uh, and for our social services, because I'm not convinced that we need to do that to fund those things. It is more so that they don't have as much money <laughs> because um, and, you know, um, uh, because they that money turns into turns into uh, political power. And um, that is a problematic yeah I'm, I'm talking more about you know just generally being able to fund all the social programs that yeah programs but but that, but uh, but, guys talk. but because we have um because because the united states i think has a unique relationship to its currency and to um and spending and so we don't really i don't think that we need at this point because our currency is pegged to nothing um that we need to tax to spend we don't really need to do that in this country um and I so mean, it all comes to like um sorry for interrupting but it all comes down to you know what percentage of gdp is the public sector you know in your country i think it's something like 35 percent and here it's from like low 40s to like 15 cents you know and it all comes down to I know, I know you, you like to talk about, yeah, we can just, you know, print money and fund those uh, social programs. I'm just saying it's a lot easier to tax consumption and just have broad taxation for everything and then redistribute than to implement a system that's going to effectively increase taxes for wealthier and at the same time, you know, decrease for... Uh, so I you're just, saying as a, as, a, as, a, as simply as a you're just you're 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 suggesting as simply as a political matter that might be an easier route to take. It's not just political. It's like, for instance, let's say because um, we have similar problems. Like we don't have as much inequality as you guys, but the reason that we get to have all those social programs is because. Our government represents like forty-eight percent of our. Um, no, that's not growth. why you get to have those programs. That is not why you've got the causation wrong. The reason why you get to have those programs is because you because the people who the vast majority of people 
um, have the political power to make sure that there was government provides those programs. That's why you have those programs. It's not yeah, because yeah, it, those programs are, that, are really popular. Like even the right wing is. Not I understand, like but but, but but I'm saying that the reason why we don't have those pro those those programs here is not because we can't afford it. It is because of the wealth concentration inhibits are the the political will of the vast majority of people who want those programs yeah i'm not i'm not really arguing against that um uh, my point was basically like that the left even in like especially when they talk about they all talk about income taxes in general when they talk about um basically tax higher percentage of incomes for wealthy people than yeah. they do now and i'm saying that it's much easier and not just like in terms of like accounting but but here's the easy to... thing right but... a wealth tax we can move past income if we have a wealth tax and you have a cutoff it's actually quite straightforward but it's also it's not a question of the difficulty in implementing the 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 difficulty in implementing in this country either one of what you're talking about is a political problem it is a it is not a a technical one that's the yeah. issue and so uh, but i i appreciate the call i will uh, uh oh, contemplate yeah. them. Thanks. thanks thanks for taking my call thanks for calling have fun guys you have fun thanks uh, for calling i think we should have like a basically 100 percent consumption tax on luxury items until i i mean i think you could do until we uh, like draw down the money I mean, I think there's something to be said about that, without a doubt. I mean, the the issue is that like, like how about like a seventy billion dollar tax on if you own your own like uh, space rockets? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I would, I would look at like first purchases only made by like t billionaires, and then all those things those are going to be taxed like five hundred percent, right. maybe more. Right. And then we'll go down the line, and things that are only bought by rich people, like all that stuff's getting taxed. Yeah, the issue is that consumption is not just consumption. Living in America without consumption, as it's currently constructed, is impossible. So, like, even the poorest among us have to consume, um, and they'll consume products like you know cheaper food or whatever, or they'll have to buy things. So that's why a consumption tax in America, as currently constructed, yeah, is as it would be implemented helpful. by our current political system, it would be just it, like it, on cigarettes, incredibly and regressive, even more and so right. than now. And but the also the the other problem is is that like Jeff Bezos is never going to be able to spend <laughs> the like the, the the part of Jeff Bezos, let's say, that is problematic in terms of his wealth. It's never going to get spent. Yeah, I mean that's the problem here, and the and the problem is like, you know, is in my mind is you know uh, the, the the Gates Foundation going in and, and dropping a, a trillion dollars into education and, um, and you know completely changing the the direction of education in this country um, if you know I, I, the, the the consumption tax doesn't you know if you could go back maybe maybe in time but I I suspect Ten. that Europe is going to have a a similar problem over time with with billionaires and and they will catch up to us in that regard and as to like the they'll just uh, avoid taxes uh point with why it's hard to tax them like that just makes official what i think i unofficially think about billionaires which is that they're criminals so if they start avoiding taxes then you treat them like criminals and start and go get it right um for resto, we have a pretty good historical case of study for how participatory economics affects the quality of labor. Back in the 1800s, authors were paid by the word instead of receiving royalties. As a result, authors habitually changed the style they wrote in and the structure of their books to stretch out the word count. That's why many of Charles Dickens' books are so wordy and excessively descriptive. Is that true? No. Matt. This was like right up your alley. We have a good uh, historical case study for how participatory economics affects the quality of labor. Back in the 1800s, authors were paid by the word instead of receiving royalties. As a result, authors habitually changed the style they wrote in, the structure of their books to stretch out the word count. That's yeah. why many of Charles Dickens' books are so wordy and excessively descriptive. Yeah, uh, I kind of like that, though. Yeah, so there you go. Dave, uh, the Dave. 
Probably why Bleak House is so loud. <laughs> hey, MR crew, I'm currently listening to Inflame Deep Medicine in the Anatomy and Justice ah. by former guest Rupa Marta and Raj Patel, writing to say that I've just hit the chapter on Monsanto and round up and your past guest who talked about just has given me a larger understanding of it all and just how deep uh, we are. Left is best. That's cool. That's a uh, that's a a double guest over uh, a, a guest overlap, right? Because I had uh, the author of Inflamed on Thursday, and then we just had uh, the Monsanto guest. There you go. GB eighty three Bradley, please forgive us. Sorry for forgetting people's names. Uh, Rupa Myra and Bart Elmore. Bart Elmore. Uh, Zephi, given how far Republican-run states have already rolled back access to abortion care, would overturning Roe make all that uh, much of a functional difference at this point? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, there have been states that have rolled it back, but you're going to see like 25 states uh, uh, effectively outlawed. Um, and then the next thing they'll do is they'll say, you can't cross the, the, the they'll try and pass laws saying you can't cross state lines fugitive abortion laws yes 101 law gnomes in regards to january 6th when will we know who was giving tours on january 5th there's a lot of stuff like that that i want to find out uh happy pampy sam just found out my wife is pregnant with what will hopefully be our first child can i get a shofar you can indeed <laughs> get some sleep Get some sleep. Get some sleep. Uh, we don't have that uh, that 719 on, Bradley? The dude was very, very adamant about calling in. Very, very mm -hmm. mad. I couldn't quite tell what they were talking about, but... 719, I think it's 719. I don't know. Maybe try out 713. Where's the 713? All right. All right. No, no, that's not it. Um, here is uh, Senate Majority Whip Dick Durbin yesterday speaking with the media on Capitol Hill about the mood that Joe Manchin's in. That's we are all got to be worried about what mood Joe Manchin's in. Um, you'll recall that his early problems with the Build Back Better bill was that it was too small, one right. four trillion. Then it became uh, too big. Then it became a hammock for people. And then he was worried about inflation. And then they came out and all the rating agencies said, this is not going to contribute to inflation. And now he's worried about the latest COVID variant. The latest COVID, Omicron, uh, may, may be a reason to pause on the Build Back Better bill. He's running out of yeah. reasons. And the lately. crowd, we're all just like waiting to see what color the smoke is that comes out of the chimney. And it's always uh, just obstructionist. Here's Dick uh, Durbin with- <laughs> Cut things. With his, um, his, I guess, foray into guessing what color that smoke is. <laughs> I'm not sure. We need Joe Manchin's vote to pass it. Uh, he's been engaged in negotiations for weeks on end, perhaps for months. I said to him at least a month ago, Joe, you've made your mark on this bill. You've dramatically cut its cost. You have also made sure that we pay for everything that we do. It doesn't add to the deficit, so it's not inflationary. You've done these things, Joe. Now close the deal. It's time for us to do something for the American people, and this will help them. You want to put Americans back to work? Of course they're concerned about COVID. They're also concerned about child care. And we address that in this bill, as we should. So there are elements that I think will help America get back on its feet and will not be inflationary. I wonder if they are, like, out there, like, basically trying to help with his narrative now, where it's like, he really hacked away at this. He's he'd be great. It's also the reality. It's He's like, all, it's, I mean, he has hacked away at this. He has yeah. done what he promised his third way crowd that he'd do. He has done what the no labels crowd wanted him to do. He hacked away the bill and now he's trying to still eke out another another cut, which is the paid family leave provision, which I didn't realize Patty Murray said this in the article that was in our packet today that in 1993 they have the Democrats passed paid leave, but that it wasn't able to get past the Senate, I believe. 
um, maybe I'm I'm wrong on this, but because they wanted bipartisan, they wanted the paid leave bill to be bipartisan, which is exactly what Manchin's saying now, mm. and that was 30 years ago. Yep. That's that's that. Those are the prospects of a bipartisan paid leave bill. It's like giving a toddler positive feedback. Like, good job. You did it. You really did it, Joe. You got the price down. You got everything paid for. There's not going to be inflation. Good job. I mean, it almost you need like to, to send AOC down to West Virginia and just uh, do an interview. I'm vanquished. Could. I can't believe how um, how how Joe Manchin has, you know, really shown us. Can she fake tears? Can she fake tears? Right. Go on every local West Virginia cable show and then just cry about how Joe Manchin hurt her. Calling from a 610 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Sam. Yeah. Sam, it's your uh, it's your old friend, Thames Darwin. Thames Darwin. Long time. No hear from. Well, I've never heard from you, Sam, because I've never actually called into the phone before. So well, uh, I haven't seen you on the I am. Let's put it that way. Right, right. So I had a question for you. I really enjoyed the interview, and I wanted to, but I did tune in a little bit late. So I wanted to, first of all, know, did he happen to mention what the Russian word for workers' council is? No. Yeah, that word is Soviet. Okay. So the um, the, the initial sort of uh, idea behind the USSR was that it would be uh, council communism. But ultimately, obviously, it went in a different direction. Right. But, the, the idea, I mean, this is just a subset of socialism that he's talking about. He's just talking about non-state socialism. It's, it still is putting means of production in the hands of workers. That's socialism. It still is, um, uh, you know, seeking to uh, redistribute wealth for greater equity. You know, that's socialism as well. I mean, it, it's just a, a different way of organizing it away from state planning and to the author has a relationship with Thompson. Thompson has been talking about this kind of thing for, you know, years. Yeah. No, I mean, I think I, I don't think he would dispute, as far as I could tell what you were saying, because you got, you got cut off a little bit. I don't think he would dispute that. Yeah. It's, but, I, you know, the other the other thing is, like, how do you transition into this kind of economy? Well, that's... When Jeremy, yes. when Jeremy Corbyn was running for prime minister in the U.K., he had a really interesting... Oh, dude. Uh, uh, a you're corporation come up for set. Is that any better? Well, you 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 you, you sound in clear until you cut out. You must have not not have great service. Yeah, I, I unfortunately I don't. I'm in a parking lot right now. Let, let me see if I can get this point out. When Corbyn was running for uh, for prime minister in the UK, he had a proposal that any time a corporation came up for sale, the first pass for buyer had to go to the workers. That's one way that you begin this transition. Yep. Another way you begin the tra another way you begin the transition is you begin to uh, to demand, and you do it through legislation if necessary to put workers on on uh, on uh, corporate boards. Yeah. The problem is then you still have that dilemma of the what I'm sorry. What did he call it again? The um, uh, not the PMC. The what did he call it? The, the co coordinating class. Coordinating class. class. You still have that. I mean, that's that's the that's that's what I, you know, if we had another hour, maybe we'll, maybe we'll have him back on. That that's the part that I don't understand. Like, how do you get past that stage? Um, right. And I don't. I you know, the, getting from here to there, it seems like a like a difficult. But 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 maybe maybe you know, I mean, I I am. You know, I think the, even the way that you get to the stage that you're talking about, you know, how do you get from here to that stage? And and for me, that's where like stuff like antitrust comes in. You know, you just right, got to keep. Right. I mean, in a country like this one, it's a much heavier lift. Obviously, yeah. I mean, just because of the way the corporations are already controlling legislation to a really large extent. Yep. Appreciate right. the call, man. No worries. Bye bye. Good to hear your voice after all these years. Oh. Yeah, many, many years. Like years and years. Like I feel like like Air America days even. Ten years. Call him from a six one six. Yeah. Fifty. Somewhere years. in between there. Call him from a six one six area code. That's the Heidegger thing, sorry. Oh. The Rogan parody. Six one six. Hello? Hello. Six one six. Hello. 
That was you, caller. That was it. Bye bye. Gone. Gonzo. They did not have good phone reception. Um, what should we do? Uh, which one of the Tucker Carl? We're going to do both of those. Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's do the first Tucker Carlson on the uh, Chris Cuomo, and then we'll move into the more even insane stuff. Um, so, Chris Cuomo, it turns out. Um, uh, lied to everybody, supposedly uh, including his CNN bosses. Um, as you know, he was a primetime uh, newscaster mm -hmm. whose brother was the um, the uh, now you know de defamed, um, disgraced, disgraced former Andrew governor Cuomo, of New York. God, governor. that feels so good to say. Yes, still. yeah. And it turns out that not only was um, Chris Cuomo not just advising or not not advising um andrew cuomo but he was basically like you know talking about well, we can dig up some stuff on the on the people who are accusing you of being a lecherous scumbag and i mean from my estimation there should have never ever been forget the scandal you you you're hosting a news program you should not be the person who's covering your brother. And probably Let alone you... using, as was discovered, resources right. to investigate the women who were making accusations against uh, Andrew Cuomo, which is, you know, based on the AG report, is heavily, heavily substantiated. Now, the, the, the thing that I'm talking about is on CNN. Yeah. No, too. but I mean... But this is also on Chris Cuomo. But Tucker Carlson... I'm shocked he went with this. Here's Tucker Carlson weighing in on this. What's he going to do? Is he going to attack CNN or is he going to attack CNN? The only thing you can't do at CNN, the thing that they will never tolerate, is displeasing the people in charge. That means not simply Jeff Zucker, who runs the company, but the billionaires who run our country. If you cross them, you're done. So this morning when we saw The Atlantic magazine, we knew it was curtains for Chris Cuomo. The Atlantic is owned by Steve Jobs' widow. It functions as a kind of modern social register, a place for the ruling class to talk to itself. And The Atlantic decided that it was deeply displeased Chris Cuomo had dared to help his brother, the former governor of New York, when he was accused of sexual harassment. Chris Cuomo must go, The Atlantic declared. And then we knew he would. We knew it was over. In the world that Jeff Zucker lives in, the Atlantic makes the rules. Cuomo was done. And that's when, for the first time ever, and very unexpectedly, we started to feel sorry for Chris Cuomo. All right, pause it for one second. his brother is not the pause worst thing. How much, like, like and, and go back a little bit, we just contemplate the frickin' pretzels that he's got to tie himself into to make it the reason why Chris Cuomo has been suspended is because the Atlantic called for it? How many people read the Atlantic magazine? How many people are even aware that it exists in this country? It's so funny that thing you said about it's like the clearinghouse for the uh, ruling class or whatever. Like, wait, that is wait. something people say about, like, the mainstream media, but, like, that, that doesn't mean, like, it's determining who has to fire who. Like, it's what you just so absurd. It's also, just like the, the billionaires who run our country. Like you work for one. A billionaire I was about who runs, to say who right. runs several countries, including ours. Right, and you also are an heir to hundreds of millions of dollars. In addition to making, it. let's be clear, Tucker Carlson. Um, I, I don't know if he ever didn't go to a private school in his entire. He got kicked out of a couple. One was in Switzerland. One was in Newport, Rhode Island. Let's be honest. He's talking about all of his buddies. And it would be a different situation if he were like a socialist and trying to fight for uh, those kinds of institutions to be overturned. But the, the difference is, is he's just he's high. He, he's trying to direct the right wing ire and energy towards the billionaires that uh just like are culturally associated with the democrats as opposed to the ones who are actually making money for the people that fund his show and the party that he supports i just love the idea that like oh, we got to figure out an angle here what is the, the atlantic call for? oh the atlantic call for okay good we yeah, can go with the that atlantic. but here he is here's where he takes the turn he feels sorry now for chris cuomo we knew he would we knew it was over in the world that jeff zucker lives in the atlantic makes the rules cuomo was done <laughs> 
And what? that's when, for the first time ever, and very unexpectedly, we started to feel sorry for Chris Cuomo. We did. Helping his brother is not the worst thing Chris Cuomo ever did. In fact, it may have been the best thing he ever did. Not because Andrew Cuomo was a good person. He certainly oh, wasn't I'm a sorry. good Don't person. Andrew Cuomo screen. was loathsome. Look but Andrew Cuomo... We started to feel really bad for Chris. <laughs> okay, sorry, go back. It's even a, like this, this. Who is we? Who is we? It's the royal we. It's the heir, the Swanson, uh, the, the, the Swanson uh, family trust. Fair began and balanced. To feel bad. Look at that Chiron. All right. First thing Chris Cuomo ever did. In fact, it may have been the best thing he ever did. Not because Andrew Cuomo was a good person. He certainly wasn't a good person. Andrew Cuomo was loathsome. But Andrew Cuomo was Chris Cuomo's brother. And that's what you do with brothers, even the loathsome ones. You help them when they need it. Period. It's called loyalty. At CNN, as at the rest of the media, this is an alien concept. Is there a single person at CNN or any other left-wing network who would risk his job to help his own brother? No. Above all these people are careerists, ruthless careerists. They would betray anyone to get ahead. If Jeff Zucker told this guy to denounce his own wife on television, do you think he'd hesitate before doing it? Well, of course he wouldn't, not for a second. So when we tell you that the media are corrupt, we don't just mean they're corrupt politically. It is much deeper than that. They don't acknowledge the most important rules in life. Rose before your hope. first obligation is to your family. Your first obligation is not to the state, it's not to a political party, it's not to Jeff Zucker or some creepy billionaires at the Atlantic Magazine, it's not even to your own career. Your most basic obligation is to the people you are related to. When they need your help, no matter who they are, even if they're the governor of a state, even if they're horrible people, you help them anyway, because it's your family. Chris Cuomo. Wow, so, uh like the family so this is uh, he could have gotten a really a much simpler route calling out cnn's corruption or the media's corruption and he could have just pointed out that chris cuomo didn't follow journalistic ethics and i thought he would have done the simple layup of like they're hypocrites right oh they call us out or they they don't they say fox news is unethical look at these this breach of ethical values but no he went a he went a different way well to be fair there may be a certain amount of emotion in, in, in this instance. Uh, Tucker, his uh, his had some issues with his mom. His mom left the family when he was uh, in his, I think, eight or nine. I think it was right after he started wearing the bow ties. And uh, he started wearing the bow ties. My understanding is in junior high. And um, Tucker does have a brother. They did sue to get some uh, oil royalties, I think, that his mother, who he was estranged from, had uh, after she died. Uh, it, it seems like maybe that's what, what really gets him. He's, uh, you mm -hmm. know, um, interesting. The whole, um, you'd betray anyone to get a hand, that's what Cuomo was doing when he was betraying everybody who relies on him as a disinterested newsman, <laughs> like the entire viewership of CNN, to get ahead by, as in, like, protect my family. Um, but yeah. protect your family is also a way for him to. I, I, it fits into the larger puzzle of his like fascism. Right? Abs well, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Because this is, the this family is, is what's pure. What's an extension of your family? Family <laughs> rights, ch children's rights, protect the children, uh, and and all of these scary immigrants and non-white people are here to break up the traditional Aryan family or yeah. whatever. The number one obligation that I want from my news anchors is the truth. I would say, uh, not uh, to protect their family, particularly <laughs> if their family is politicians <laughs> <laughs> that running a major your state um uh finish it finish this clip up and then let's go uh, we'll go to the, the other one who they are even if they're the governor of a state even if they're horrible people you help them anyway because it's your family <laughs> chris cuomo may be an idiot and he is but he understands that well. It doesn't matter that your job is to ostensibly cover these politicians. If they're your family, that's all off. What if you're a cop and your brother, like, murders somebody? You, I guess we know what Tucker thinks to do. Yeah, exactly. Of course. Meanwhile, 
That clip was not the craziest <laughs> clip on uh, Tucker Carlson's uh, program last night. No. Last night, Tucker Carlson invited on the Blaze TV's Jason Whitlock. You remember him? He's the one who made Steven Crowder feel super uncomfortable. The one uh, who Steven Crowder asked if he played college football for five years. How, how, how long did you play college football? Five years? Here is um, Jason Whitlock with his take. Remember now, Tucker has said already on his program that bottom line is doesn't matter what your job is. Doesn't matter how unethical what you have to do to help out your family. If you're a prison guard and your brother is in prison, you let him out. You let him that out. That is the Tucker principle. That's the Tucker principle. Unless it's your mom. But wait a second, forget that. Yep. Go, go. Yep. Let's play this. Here he is bringing uh, Jason Whitlock on. Jason Whitlock, he's he's probably sitting in the green room going, God, what's the angle I'm going to go yeah, this with is now? A, this is new territory. Yeah, wait, I really thought this, yeah. they would go the simpler route, but no, they, they, they're... Wait, wait, we're, we're defending Cuomo? Okay, okay. Um, I got something, I think. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> what a thing to be fired for. Jason Whitlock is the host of Fearless. We're happy to have him join us tonight. Jason Whitlock, I cannot believe I'm opening this show with you offering a kind of defense, maybe not of Chris Cuomo himself, who I do not like, but of his priorities. When you are called upon to help your brother, no matter what he's accused of, you help because he's your brother. Am I missing something? Pause Tucker, uh, you're not missing anything. Thing, like, like, it's as if like the opportunity, like, okay, you you called upon to help your brother? Okay, I'll help my brother. I'm going to step back from my job as an anchor on CNN. That's the way you do it. But what if you can help him using your job as an anchor in CNN? Bingo. All right. Go. And another, another Chiron for the ages. It says CNN Dwarf King suspends top anchor Cuomo yeah, at the, the bottom there. So that's like, and the, it's also just part of the latent the, anti-Semitism they have in this show too. I mean, they had a zoomed in picture of, of uh, Stelter. Stelter's face. And I mean, or, or wait, I don't even know that he's been attacked uh with anti-Semitic stuff in the past, so maybe I'm making assumptions, but... But there's continue. a... I mean, they have the Proud Boy interns on, obviously. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But of his priorities, when you are called upon to help your brother, no matter what he's accused of, you help because he's your brother. Am I missing something? Tucker, uh, you're not missing anything at all, but I, I've got a completely wow, different take on this in terms of what the overall lesson here is uh, for both Cuomo brothers. It, they are the wrong complexion and they're heterosexual for the time that they're living in and they're finding out you can't be woke enough. And the Cuomo yeah. brothers have tried to play the woke game but they're in the same crosshairs as every other heterosexual man in this country. And so given an opportunity to move on from Governor Cuomo and replace him with someone else, uh, the state of New York did that. Given an opportunity to replace Chris Cuomo now uh, under, you know, because he's defending his brother and he somehow uh, has run afoul of the Me Too movement of feminist and just the whole, in my view, the alphabet mafia, he, he doesn't fit the right profile. And so they're going to replace him with someone who does fit Place. the profile. Place. This whole diversity, inclusion, and equity, D-I-E, die. And what they're, the people in the crosshairs <laughs> are men, heterosexual men, white men are in the crosshairs. But so, so he says crosshairs multiple times and replace multiple times. Well, Someone, me, people are getting, white men are getting replaced. Just, just, just you know, like put them together a little right. bit. You don't get it. Yeah. Okay. He's being a good ally. Mm. <laughs> Whitlock's being a good ally yeah. to white cis men. And it's about time. Thank you. Thank, thank you for, for the allyship. Uh, because of course, Cuomo, the brothers were taken out because they're white men. Yeah, if you want to avoid scandal, you want to be uh, dark complected and gay. Right, like, exactly. Like, like of Lil course. <laughs> exactly. Of course. Of course. It's the only way you hide in plain sight. <laughs> this is like, I wonder if, if Tucker's going like, whoa, this is pretty good. I thought we did a pretty good job with blaming the Atlantic for firing Chris Cuomo. But this guy, 
This right, guy, but he lends cre- he lends credence to it that I can't. Yeah, he right? got, he got well. It's I'll, how quick can you get to replacement theory? And I think Craig Whitlock beat the record that Tucker set. That was pretty good. Uh, let's continue though, because this is pretty good stuff. Inequity, D I E, die, and what they're the people in the crosshairs are men, pause it, heterosexual pause it, men. Pause, right? pause it, pause it. I want you to go back just a little bit, and when he says the D I E. I want you to look at Tucker Carlson's face and see how this dude, half his job is to keep himself from laughing. Okay? I want you to watch this because he, it's not even laughing. It's like gleeful no, 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 excitement. No, no. Tucker is about to break out in laughter after this guy goes, diversity, inequality, it, it, die. And Tucker almost blurts out a laughter. Watch his face. Watch his face. And so they're going to replace him with someone who does fit the profile. This whole diversity, inclusion, and equity, D-I-E, die. And what they're, the people in the crosshairs are men, <laughs> heterosexual. <laughs> He's almost laughing. Did you ever see his feet? go... There's that softening after the first... Yeah, start. right there. Look at that. Look at that. That's not him smirking. That is him... That is him holding in a full-on laughter thing like this what must happen after every tucker show the guy go gets around with his guys who uh you know maybe they get on the zoom after the show or the next day all the guys are spending their time on the you know the the stormfront uh uh, chat boards or whatever it is and they go to the i i i like we were at DEFCON 7. I almost b- laughed right out loud when he said that DIE thing. That was awesome. So funny. I can't believe that. This guy's like Jesse Waters level almost crack up. I mean, that is like what Nazis think. Diversity, inclusion. What is it? Diversity, inclusion, inclusion. equity. Like Die. That, Die. that is everything that they are opposed to. All right, yeah. keep, keep playing this. Let's, uh, this Maybe is... that'll catch on. What luck? This whole diversity, inclusion, and equity, D-I-E, die. And what they're, the people in the crosshairs are men, heterosexual men, white men are in the crosshairs, but all men, black, white, whatever, are in the crosshairs. And if they can take you out of a prominent spot like Chris Cuomo has, relatively prominent at CNN, you'll get taken out when the opportunity arises and when they have your successor in place. And I believe that's what's going on with Chris Cuomo. I, 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 I think I know what you're saying. And I think a lot of people <laughs> watching can feel that you're on to Oh, my God. God, that guy's having a lot of fun. The guy's having a lot of fun at this job. Like, oh, yeah. No, I mean. I, honestly, they must just sit around and go, like, what's the most bad crap crazy take we can put on this? Uh, he, we just got it. Bingo. He gets, like, chills down his spine when he basically says anybody can get taken out at the end. He b- brings it home, Whitlock does. Anybody, men, including you. That's the message to the audience. That's not fraud. Sam, 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 I was just thinking about how you uh, talk about the reaction shot. Tucker uses it to a plum in instances other than this. His primetime predecessor, O'Reilly, used to allow the camera to cut entirely to his guests during their takes, probably because he's drinking. And I think they realized Tucker's steel face when his guests talk about replacement theory is exactly what they needed to make this messaging effective. Yeah. T-Dog, hey, I really love the show and tune in every day, but I think you guys unfairly gave the yellow, show Yellowstone a bad rap. Mm. It's not just about ranchers doing cowboy things. It's mainly about the main character, played by Kevin Costner, who owns a cattle ranch with thousands of acres and his relationship with his three children, his favorite of which is married to a Native American whose family lives on a reservation and the differences that ensue from that. His other Sounds son, like shit. Who is the lawyer for the family and his daughter, played by Kelly Riley, who plays the baddest bitch of all... I think you guys should watch it. Really? I really enjoy it. Not doing it. Bye. I thought that was going to be a joke. Nope. Uh, Senator Sam Cedar. Recently, my father and I visited my grandfather when we got on the topic of politics, specifically COVID. They're both fully vaccinated. Both of them shot down the idea of Biden waiving vaccine IP via executive order because it would destroy the economy. (laughs) What? And is a slippery slope. 
What is your take on this? Um, it will not destroy the economy, <laughs> and one could only hope it's a slippery slope. But no, I think you could you could say the if you really were worried about the slippery slope, you could say, well, there's a pandemic <laughs> that happens once every hundred years. My argument was that since the U.S. government funded the vaccine in the first place, it's really the public's IP, not the companies who took no risk. Indeed, that is also true. Ryan Cole, Democratic leadership, hate the progressives in the party more than they had the, the very worst alt-right QAnon Republican lunatic because the GOP makes them look good, whereas the squad show them for what they are, conservatives. Indeed. Uh, money isn't speech, money is power, and mo uh, power trumps speech every time. Stale Nate. Look, we can't just throw words around like apartheid willy-nilly. I think for it to be apartheid, it has to come from the Western Cape region of South Africa. I don't know what that uh, what that was a response to. I mean, that's a common joke framing where people get too uptight about the certain. It's like how um, a certain type of it's only sparkly wine if it's from a certain region or champagne right. is from a certain region of France. So it's only apartheid if it's from uh, mm. South Africa. Got you. Dr. Chaos MD, a, a stochastic terrorism is becoming much more prominent tactic of the GOP in order to take and keep power. It's incredibly worrying. It's becoming a much more um, visible tactic. We remember that book we had with uh, Edward Miller about gun or nut country about right wing Dallas uh, in the lead up to the Kennedy assassination. Uh, how just insane, like and murderous their rhetoric has been. So I think now it's basically like um, they can't hide this stuff in uh, newsletters and stuff. Yeah. Um, should we do the Steve Ducey with Doctor Oz? Oh yeah. Um. Just looking at this. Oh, I meant to send Dr. Oz's campaign ad or his announcement because his whole thing's about medical freedom. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, there's a lot of... Um, is it in the sheet? I'm sorry. The uh, No, I don't know that it, that that his ad is necessarily, but um, <laughs> the British Medical Journal did a, um, did a study of... Uh, <laughs> well, this is actually University of Alberta in Canada came up with the number of uh, just how much Dr. Oz's um, advice has absolutely no evidence to back it up or is ac absolutely wrong. They have a percentage? Yeah, let's see. It, um, the quack factor? Yeah, the quack factor. Let's see. Uh, the research showed on average the show gives their viewers around 12 different recommendations per episode, but only half of them are supported by research. 50-50. Yeah, 50-50. It's, yeah. like, it's like, like casino odds. Yeah, right. I mean, I was about to say, that's like a decent if you're sports betting. Let's watch uh, Ducey first with this guy. Oh, this is from last year? Some of his COVID. Okay, let's hear some of his COVID stuff, and then we'll... Uh... Dr. Oz, we all know the symptoms of coronavirus. Uh, we know it really well. But I was reading a, a story in the Miami Herald, I believe, yesterday about how the number, you know, one of the symptoms is uh, tightness uh, in your uh, chest or one, trouble one breathing. Second. Just to be clear, just to be clear, this is March 26th of 2020. This is, uh, you know, th two weeks after the lockdown basically started. Go ahead. I read that apparently Google searches for panic attacks was up like 100% or something like that because people are suffering from anxiety because they're at home, they're watching their news, they're worried about their families, they're worried about their jobs. What sort of advice would you have for people who are feeling anxious and frustrated right now? They don't have coronavirus, they're just worried. Oftentimes they think they have coronavirus because they're so anxious about it. So every small little symptom, you know, they don't quite yeah. smell as well this morning as they did yesterday. They think they have it. They, they have a little cough, a little belly ache. And again, I don't want to downplay these issues because they may actually have coronavirus because people have very mild symptoms often. But the panic attack is devastating and it is a physical problem. It's not just in your head, your whole body, the, the rapid palpitations, the sweating, the, the feeling that the, like the world is closing in around you. And these symptoms can cause all kinds of detrimental effects, which is why I, I think a lot of doctors now are feeling that the worry and the panic about coronavirus is going to be worse than the actual coronavirus for them. 
And if we can sort of balance that out, for the first you know, few months, we were all saying, guys, wake up, this is a problem. Now the medical community is saying, Dad, step it back for a second. You're going to be fine. If you look at the, at the survival numbers, if you're under the age of 20, we don't have a death yet. I don't, there are very few above that until you get into the 50s. So it's a pretty safe virus for the majority of Americans. The panic you're experiencing is only going to pull you away from the calmness yeah. you need to succeed. Yeah, there you go. Well, apparently, doctor. That didn't was, age too well. <clears throat> it did not age too well. I mean, it may be the case, but there is also, you know, between 20 and 50. I mean, it's just only people over the age of 50, which is more or less half the country, um, have to worry about this. Uh, it's probably a panic attack. 800,000 lives later. Lost so many people to those panic attacks. <laughs> um, but. Let's play. Let's play the ad from yeah. uh, Doctor Oz so that we can see him. Uh, this is him like, launching his. And do we know why he's <laughs> running in Pennsylvania? Because there's an open seat. Because there's an open seat. I mean, my guess is that uh, he does not live in Pennsylvania full time. I've been I'd... voting absentee there actually. Oh, he has. Interesting. Okay. But from his mother, in... he's been voting absentee from his mother-in-law's address. Is that true? I mean, it's interesting because I I would guess that his his show is taught, like shot in either New York or in L.A. But um, regardless, I, I'm it, I think it should be a little concerning for the Democrats uh, in oh, yeah. in uh, in Pennsylvania because Republicans have shown an ability to parlay their fame and whatever charisma they have on television into successful presidential and, and uh, <laughs> office bids in the past. I don't know. And he's going to clearly ride this COVID misinformation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Watch freedom. this. He's, he's, he's almost full on coming out, like going like, hey, if you're an anti-vaxxer, I, uh, you got a home here. Yeah, Go. right. Exactly. My parents came to America to find a better life, and they did. I attended great universities, raised a family, and became a successful surgeon. I invented a heart valve that saves thousands of lives. Then I started a TV show to advocate for you taking control of your health and took on the medical establishment to argue against costly drugs and skyrocketing medical bills. But COVID has shown us that our system is broken. We lost too many lives, too many jobs, and too many opportunities because Washington got it wrong. They took what? away our freedom without making us safer and tried to kill our spirit and our dignity. As a heart surgeon, I know how precious life is. Pennsylvania needs a conservative who will put America first, one who can reignite our divine spark, bravely fight for freedom, and tell it like it is. That's why I'm running for Senate. I'm Dr. Oz, and I approve this message. It's literally like they walk through the orchard of of Republican uh, cliches and memes, and they just picked from every tree and put it into a bucket. And I got to say, whoever wrote that was pretty good. They worked in like the divine spark. Mm -hmm. He's getting the fundamentalists, America first. He's getting the Trumpers. Uh, the medical establishment got it wrong. He's getting the anti-vaxxers. And then he also They're talked to about kill your dignity. But like things like costly drug prices, yep. which are always a way to to uh, manipulate people into voting for republicans who want to raise your drug prices but i don't know i mean the senate race just got a bit more interesting uh i i would say i think he's got a, a good shot unfortunately Featherman, uh, Featherman, support Featherman. miss pronouns when is magic spoon going to make a majority uh majority report blend uh bourbon socialist the Republicans are the party of, uh, oh, you said that already, uh, kind of linguist. <laughs> Is it just me or Bongo the Gorilla, a dead ringer for a certain cold-footed uh, fellow? If I'm Crowder, I'm suing Dana for royalties for using my likeness. <laughs> Spocko, Meadows is a known liar. His book revelation about Trump testing positive and then negative before the debate needs to be investigated. Subpoena the doctors who tested Trump. The White House Medical Unit is headed by Trump's personal doctor, Sean Conley. Remember how cagey he was about Trump's testing date? Now we know why the White House didn't cooperate on contact tracing following the White House Rose Garden event. It would point to Trump. There's something to be true. Uh, uh, they should be investigating this. And maybe... I don't know. Maybe that's why they dropped that as soon as he was, um, you know, Meadows agreed to, to testify. I'm not sure. 
Ebuenara, thank you for yesterday's Wengrove Civilization discussion and today's Albert discussion on participatory economics, most immediately because they're among the two most deeply moving inquiries to me. You're welcome. Dan from Columbus. Emma's comment about Sarah Huckabee Sanders being heckled reminds me of the news cycle about decency because Michelle Wolf wa- mocked her at the White House Correspondence Dinner. For her eye Smoky shadow. eye. Yeah, which like, which they said was about her appearance. Literally just like about how she does her makeup. That's all. Well, it That's technically off-base. was about her appearance, but it wasn't saying the thing about her appearance that they thought. That they, yeah. <laughs> was... I mean, they just like, what did they think it ended that it was? Like Smokey the Bear or no, something? No, they thought like it like that? we're talking about her, like, uh, like her. Her weight, but you know, that's, I don't know what it was. That's, know, yeah. that's you saying that. That has no correlation to anything about like her actual appearance, but I mean. Outside of how she does her makeup, which I don't even think counts. Also, remember when Kathy Griffin did that horrible thing on that magazine cover? Yep. Right, that too. Calling from a 518 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, Sam. This is Jack calling from Albany. How are you? Jack from Albany. I am well. What's on your mind, Jack? Uh, well, I've, I've been thinking a lot about the uh, New York 2022 Democratic primary. Um, and specifically sort of how I feel like Kathy Hochul is sort of a wolf in sheep's clothing for progressives. Um, so basically she has kept a lot of people from Cuomo's administration. Uh, I don't think she's doing enough to hold the Cuomo people to account. For example, um, she's left the president of SUNY who, you know, was helping Cuomo during the the period at which he was abusing the staffers. Um, And I'm just sort of nervous that New York State is going to be left with another fake progressive who, you know, slaps her name on these progressive policies that are, you know, half measures uh, rather than a true progressive like perhaps Jumani Williams or Letitia James. Um, so I was just wondering what, what you were thinking about Kathy Hochul up to this point. I, I mean, uh, I'm not, a, I'm not, a, if you think I'm not a huge fan, but I will say this, the, the difference between Kathy Hochul and, and Andrew Cuomo at the very least um, is going to be, is really is, is the Senate is that you don't have uh, the IDC anymore. And that the just the 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 context in which she operates is different. But I, but I agree with you. Like I, I she would not be my first choice. Um, and it's possible that Swazi may sort of eat into um, her support. So um, in that respect, it's it it's, could be a four person race. I mean, I just worry about I I I would probably want I would want Jamani to win um, as of now, but. He, he's it, it's going to be interesting if him and tish james kind of split the leftier side of the vote yeah yeah that's what i'm that's what i'm worried about as well uh i i think she's really going to be able to sort of back into the nomination you know with, with them both out there um uh, but i mean I, I i hope we can push her to the left with this upcoming legislative session uh i think she's going to try to to portray herself as uh, sort of with Swazi in there, I think she's going to try to portray herself as more of a moderate. So yep. uh, I, I think I, I do think that we, we really need to push her to the left. And, and if we can't do that, then we really have to get on board with either Tish James or Jamani Williams if we're going to have a true progressive governor in New York State. I agree. We probably Great. should make that decision early. Um, and I, I, I don't know about you, but I, in terms of record, I, Jamani seems to stand ahead. On progressive, uh, yeah. I mean, as far as progressive, yeah, progressive bona fides, I, I would have to agree. He he certainly does. Uh, statewide electability, on the other hand, you know that yeah. that sort of makes me lean towards Tish James. Yep. But um, well, yeah, she's going to run on. Say thanks, you guys, for doing the show. Sure. Let me just quickly just say, and, uh, in terms yeah, of just, like for people who who may not realize, as AG, she's going to be able to use all of this Cuomo stuff to her advantage. And I think that that you might be right about electability, but in terms of like if if the race is wide open at this point, we should start building up Jumani, um, 
because he's the most progressive. But appreciate the call. Agreed, agreed. Thanks, guys, and and, and we'll, we'll see you. We'll see you in Boston for the big live. I love oh. it. Charge. What the hell was that guy's name now? I can't even remember. How far is Albany to Boston? Like three hours? Albany to Boston, three hours. Maybe a little bit less. You get right on the pike. It's not the pike out there. It's 90. Then you hop on it, but then it turns into the pike. I just was on 90 going up to Vermont. Two hours, 40. Two hours is 40 minutes. There you go. Super easy. You know, I just... Super distance. easy. I can figure that out. Um, no problem. Here's uh, CNN's Aaron Burnett and Manu Raju talking about the absolute crap show. Do we have that tweet that I sent you? Just uh, like, like, go through this. This is absolutely nuts <laughs> what's going on. So what, what's that? Uh, Mace, right? Yeah, Nancy Mace. We, Nancy played Mace. Her we played her yesterday where she went on Fox and basically said, like, um, being infected is 27 times more protection than the vaccine, which is not not true. You have like a big black, th we can't see a thing. Um, and then she went on CNN and, and said, like, I'm a big fan of the vaccine. And then apparently Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, attacked her for uh, for her calling out Lauren Boebert. Um, I mean, it really is. Uh, Nancy Mace, just come on the scene. I never heard of her before the CNN Fox News thing. And now she's apparently at not right wing enough for the yeah this is re this is reality <clears throat> tv convoluted drama like you have to there's there was an initial aggression that turned into uh, a tree of multiple aggressions and feuds well, and oof. we got Here's, a grammar mistake by marja taylor green yeah, well she writes your... nancy mace is the trash in the gop conference never attacked by democrats or rhinos the same thing because she is not i mean like, apostrophe I, yes I, I, yeah because she is not conservative she's pro-abort <laughs> Mace, you can back up off of Lauren Boebert or just go hang with your real gal pals, the Jihad Squad. You're, Y-O-U-R, <laughs> out of your league. And then um, Mace responded, you're, okay. Y-O-U-R, uh, I mean, Y-O-U, apostrophe R-E. And while I'm correcting you, I'm a pro-life fiscal conservative who is attacked by the left all weekend, as I often am, as I defied China while in Taiwan. Well, that's... What I'm not is a religious bigot or racist. You might want to try that over there in your little league. And then <laughs> uh, back over. Uh, and then Ed Kinzinger, um, who's uh, on his way out the door. I love this, but worth noting, while this battle between Nancy Mace and the unserious circus barker, uh, Mick Splat... McSpace Space laser, laser, the GOP leader, talking about McCarthy, continues his silent streak uh, that would make a monk blush. And then lastly, um, Solwell says, I say this feels like high school, but high schoolers know how to spell your Y-O-U. Mm, I, I mean, here's the thing that I think like... Um, Solwell's all over the place these watch, days. Watch this, uh, M Manu uh, Raju and Aaron Burnett's thing, because it is... There's like a quality about all of these people that is being not quite highlighted. All day on Twitter and just this evening behind closed doors, Kevin McCarthy summoned each of them for private meetings, discussing with them and telling them this message. He wanted them to, quote, stop it. That message, Aaron, did not take hold. Green emerged from McCarthy's meeting and told our colleague Melanie Zanona that she would support a primary challenge against Nancy Mace. And she also said that Donald Trump would support a primary challenge against Nancy Mace. And when asked by reporters just moments ago about that, Mace had a colorful response saying about, about Green. She said, all I can say about Marjorie Taylor Green is bless her effing heart. That was the exact on the record quote from Congresswoman Nancy Mace. So all this playing out at a critical time for the GOP as they're trying to focus on the agenda, trying to focus on their message, keeping their party in line, and the man in the middle, Kevin McCarthy, having a hard time doing just that. Oh, my God. Are we going to hear another sob story for the leader of the, of the Republican Party of how he can't control his people? He's been nurturing this. They all have been. This is the Republican Party. This is not a rogue element of the Republican Party. This is the Republican Party. Poor 
Kevin McCarthy. He's just like the teacher and the kids are being unruly. They won't stop throwing spitballs. And he says, cut it out. But she, as soon as she left the principal's office, she said the F word. Boehner was the same way. He can't, he can't help it. It's not his fault. It's none of the Republicans. We need the good Republicans. We need the good, we need a strong Republican party. It's I mean, so honestly, I, I, maybe I'm a, there's something wrong with me, but I'd totally watch a reality show about them. <laughs> so yeah, real Congress people of Washington, D.C. Yeah. I would love to see, and I would love to see how often Marjorie Taylor Greene is intoxicated. I, mm. I would say probably. Uh, the, she would be amazing at the wine throwing, and we know that that is one of the top qualities necessary for an excellent reality television personality. She would flip tables too, right? It's like part, part of what she's been training for in CrossFit. <laughs> um, all right, let's do this last one. Which number is that, uh, Bradley? Number 10. Oh, all right, I had that, okay. Sorry. Um, all right, last, uh, this is a, uh, this is footage from, that released by the FBI. Um, January 6th, uh, writer Danny Rodriguez, who um, apparently uh, admits to having used a taser on a Capitol Police officer, is asked whether he thought um, the 3% uh, are, are those are patriot. Well, here, well, let's play this clip. Danny, did you feel like you were the three percent here? Like, like, like those people that stormed the Capitol? That those were patriots. Those are people who are doing that because they were the three percent that were going to free our country from fraudulent politicians and schemes uh, of evil people. So that way we could have a republic that was going to be whole again. Is that what you thought? You thought you were that 3% guy. I know, man. I know. It's okay. I'm sorry, guys. Right? No, we, we know. Look, look, listen. So sorry, we, we know you thought that you were that 3% so guy. Sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't know that we were doing the wrong thing. I thought we were doing the fucking right thing. I thought we were going to be... I'm so stupid. I thought I was going to be awesome. <laughs> I thought I was a good guy. I wanted to... Uh, I mean, the three percenters are uh, basically a uh, militia movement. If it's like will. a mythology based around the idea that only three percent of people will stand up for, like, for instance, the American Revolution to like do a revolution, stand up against the king or whatever. And I think like this captures like this is what's going to happen as long as the Republicans make it a um, campaign issue that they're going to say the election was stolen. You're going to have people like that who take them at their word and cry, try to go do something about it. Exactly. Exactly. This shows you the influence of the president getting up there and saying, let march down to the Capitol. Let them know that you're here. Some of these people, I mean, I think the, you know, I think the majority of the people who were there protesting are probably like this guy. And then I think there was a core group of people who definitely thought that they were going to use those people as a way of, uh, you know, like a create a current so they could get into that building and do stuff. They view mm -hmm. these guys as grist for the mill. Secondhand, but I know uh, of at least one guy who ended up um, getting arrested because of his participation there was telling people a couple of weeks before that something dramatic was going to change on that day. And that it was going to put him in a position where people couldn't say certain things to him. That's just it's empowering anecdote. for certain people. I mean, it's well, in the same way that the cult is. It's not the point being, and this guy was there. The point being is I know this guy had an expectation that something material was going to change, that this wasn't going to be just a protest. Yeah. That this was going to change 
a lever that was going to empower a different group of people. And there are powerful people giving him signals like that all the time. Without a doubt. They, the, like the Republicans who, who fomented this, they want their political rhetoric to have an effect, but to a point. But this was, this guy it was saying this. It has an effect until it doesn't. Where it was, um, he was getting this information not from the well, politicians. But what the, I don't really know what you're trying to say, though. Well, I don't want to, uh, uh, I'm just telling you that there was a guy who got arrested there that I know had confrontations with other people were saying, But when you say a lever is going to change, like which side are you saying he's in the three percenter space or is that he thinks that it's going to. No, it's going to be a new met, government in, in, yeah, in place. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. And he was going to be part of that new right, government in right. some fashion because he, the work that he was doing on that day. I mean, now, obviously uh, diluted, but there was people there who had a Thought they were very band of brothers. specific plan. They're all diluted. Some of them were had specific plans of like actual violence and some I, were used. But yep. it, I mean, I don't know how you can... The outcome is going to be the same for a lot of them in terms of how they're, yeah, you know, law enforcement. All right, let's go. Uh, we'll take one more quick phone call, and that's it. Uh, Colin from a 563 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, this is uh, Brandon. I'm from the city. Um, I'm calling in today, Sam. I'm a longtime uh, viewer, first-time caller. I think I'm like contractually obligated to say that on radio talk shows. Uh, so I I um, just moved to the city. I joined like a a, a small um, leftist like news team, and my whole thing right now is we're trying to get out. Like, you know, I mean, all of this is going on right now. We've got wealth inequality just skyrocketing. We've got what seems to be just horrible obstructionists in uh, in Congress right now, and it almost seems like there's some form of planned obsolescence there. And it, it just between all of this, the uh, the new MIT report getting revisited that you know we are on track for full societal collapse in 2040. It's really hard to be optimistic and, and get that message out to you know um, to, to 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 people and. It's like, what genuine hope I'm, is there at this point? Because, uh, you know, the, I think someone said that the, the margin that, that Democrats won by in the last midterms has now been gerrymandered away. So the House major, uh, majority has now been gerrymandered away. I mean, um, with John from San Antonio uh, disputes that assertion. Uh, that, um, But, I mean, look— um, the, I, I, I don't. I, you, you want me to quantify hope for you? I mean, come on, you can't do that. It's not. First of sure. all, it's impossible task to do. A, B, it's not a helpful task to do. Uh, because what if my answer is there is zero hope? What are you going to do then? I mean, I think well, there's hope. There's always hope. That's the whole nature of hope. Sure. I guess my question is more along the lines of what. Um, discernible action is there because uh, I mean canvassing in, in gerrymandered areas it, 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 Stephanie uh, uh, Abrams has really did a fantastic job of this but like what what do you think the most succinct calls and courses to actions are that can actually make a lasting impact because I, I know it's like an impossible uh, task to try to quantify hope but the, you know uh, as somebody who's, who's very well read and well versed on this knowledge I'd, I'd love to hear your ideas on what our path forward is even tangibly going to look like well i think there's you know three sort of i guess silos of stuff i mean i think from you know i think there's i don't know that i would uh, in and not necessarily in this order but um educating yourself and educating others about potential uh you know whether it's i, I you know it depends on what you wh wh you know wh what what beliefs you subscribe to but uh whether it's on the validity of certain policies or you know something from what we heard today from um you know michael albert in terms of like what what is possible in terms of a different economy uh the other would be you know some form of like uh activism or mutual aid or both i mean you know uh, basically developing 
relationships in your community. Um, and and the third would be, you know, sort of... Um, Bitcoin. Part, in, in Bitcoin. No, the third would be, you know, sort of more like a, you know, a electoral focus. Um, but really, the 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 you know developing those relationships in your community and through different organizations really sort of is like the first step for both the other two things yeah and i wouldn't marry it so quickly to uh like the election season you want to organize your community for things be broader than that i would look at reclaim idaho at reclaim id uh it's a grassroots organization that's doing stuff in idaho um but like i think like the electoralism like stuff y y there's just work to be done i don't know if there's hope to be sold there but there's uh, definitely i think you need to decouple it from uh, just because we might have some bad elections where democrats lose that's that's not the end of hope i think appreciate the call hang in there absolutely thanks sam Bye. all right let's read some Bye. ims so we'll get out of here thank you callers um DJ Coldcase says that uh, today's guest, Michael Albert, is currently in the Majority Report Discord. If anyone wants to continue the conversation, that's exciting. It might be the first time. It might it very well be. Uh, head that's over awesome. there, MajorityDiscord.com. Head over there, sign up. District uh, Jabroni. A very interesting guest today, but I'm still actually trying to ha wrap my head around how it's actually going to work. Personally, I have my... Have, I'd rather have my surgeon focus pretty much on solely doing surgery rather than spending their time mopping floors too. Specialization seems to work okay. I feel the problem is that people aren't compensated or acknowledge for that fact that people like janitors make it possible for the surgeons to operate in the first place. Interested in learning more about this? Head to the Discord. Travis from Pittsburgh. I want to know how much time it will take uh, to be on 80,000 councils to decide every little decision. Maybe we should be working uh, less, not more. Laura from Somerville. Charlie Baker is not seeking re-election. Sam, do you think Massachusetts yeah. has a, go uh, a chance at a progressive governor? You know, I mean, what happened in Boston was pretty encouraging. I was about to say, Michelle Wu. I mean, the what, she just like on day one or day two um, just allocated i think maybe billions of dollars to make part of the public public transit system there free yep which is pretty pretty awesome yep could be cool j man raps hey guys was wondering what your thoughts on merrick garland seems to me he's a pathetic individual who hasn't got what it takes to prosecute big time criminals like trump or his cronies i, I mean i mean yes agreed. i i think he's like <laughs> the, the exact kind of yeah lawyer the the type of that that kind of democrat like biden thinks is just so is, brilliant but it, i mean the the idea that like this w w faced mitch mcconnell you got faced we just put in a completely ineffectual um uh centrist attorney general is yeah. not going to hold any of you to account now flow the participatory system described by the guest sounds extremely uh, i think we read that already pajama boy my wife surprised me with tickets to the live show for my birthday. It'll be our first weekend oh. away from our son. It's going to be tough leaving him for two nights, but I think this will be worth it. First time in Boston, too. All right. Be da, 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 da. Charge. You mean do show far? Amos. No, I meant to do that. Yeah. Uh, we already read Amos's. Uh, Josh from Tucson. The uh, Denarchy animation reminded me. What does uh, Matt still have a mustache? What do I still have a mustache? I don't know what that I means. I do still have a mustache. Uh, Tulsi Vigeland. Wait, what is it? <laughs> Mr. Albert related. sounds like John Madden, kind of. Right. Affluence and wretchedness. If feminists had even 5% of the power the right thinks we do, the right to abortion would not be subject to the whims of nine dorks in black robes. Anybody, uh, to anyone thinking of donating to an abortion rights group today, please consider giving to an abortion fund instead of Planned Parenthood or NARAL, et cetera. Abortion funds are on the ground directly uh, helping patients get the care they need. You can find a fund in a vulnerable state via abortionfunds.org. Well, that's a good suggestion. It's a great suggestion. All right. F 10 more of these. Just another lefty. Why would anyone who puts the effort to be excel at any job, whether it's being a doctor, basketball player, 
or never an entrepreneur uh, want to empty trash or clean a bathroom, despite the common assumption that it's luck. Most people put in effort to succeed at their chosen careers. Yeah, I, the, like the I, not every basketball player is LeBron James, and not every basketball player is just like going to pick up a basketball and be naturally gifted. I also say like the demands of um, like say for instance minor league baseball players. So actually, this might not be that far off. And <laughs> yes, um, support the labor rights of minor league baseball players who are uh, basic who are criminally underpaid and uh, are also I think are or, everything but cleaning the stadium. Are organizing sense. right. And they're very talented as well, and they put in a lot of work. And 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 to be honest with you, it, it, emptying a trash can or cleaning a bathroom is not going to inhibit you from excelling at those jobs. Yeah, no, I get that. I clean. I a think as like right civil, here. yeah, like I think as civil servant, like I think it's uh, that we can't even imagine the idea that LeBron would like to have. Uh, <laughs> you know, take a vacuum through the locker room. It, that's like such a ludicrous thing. It's like a divine rate of King's um, memory block almost. And the, and the only reason why we have that presumption is because we have that, because that's the way the system has been working. Yeah. But if everybody contributed to, to all this stuff, it wouldn't be, you wouldn't be like, I can't believe I'm vacuuming this uh, carpet um, when I'm such a great basketball player. It would be like, it's my turn to vacuum the carpet. Also, I mean, I just, the, the focus on athletes frustrates me a little bit because there's such a s tiny percentage right. of the wealthy population where a lot of wealthy people um, are in that position because the, like of attributes that are easily replicable by There's the an entire of the class of people who make their money by having things. Right. And they don't actually do work. Athletes are the, actually the closest class that we have to uh, uh, the mythical meritocracy because they are able to do something and work hard at it and they are like gifted at that one thing i mean there's no such thing as a meritocracy but the rest of rich people are basically they're based on blind luck and circumstance listen taos love the guest but i managed the yoga studio good luck getting those rarefied teachers to turn down the heat keep a class log or <laughs> something beyond tracking their classes but again that's just because people go in with the presumption that they don't need to do that if they're the teacher. And 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 if if the if we started with these, I mean, that is one of the, the that's the hard part about going from A to B. How do you how do you go from the mindset that we already have into this other mindset? Because I think if like you were raised in that environment, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be like I can't believe I'm I'm you know turning up the heaters or turning down the heat. Uh, we should say, uh, not a surprise. The first Omicron case detected in California, this is uh, according to CNN and New York Times. I get news for you. It's been here. We don't know how long Probably yet. Probably started in like Kentucky or something. We, we don't know, but it's been here for play. The, the problem is we're just so crappy at testing and uh, assessing this stuff. We have no system in which that is really uh, widespread in which to do this. Um, so... Flare Child, self-deleting coordinating uh, services. Sounds fun. Nature Girl, just realized that I've been listening to you for 30% of my life now. Can I please get a shofar for my 57th birthday today? Wow. Happy birthday. Gabagool. Putting aside the real direct consequences, can we do some crass political calculation of what we think the overturning of Roe might have on the Democratic versus Republican fortunes? Returning to the question of states democratically accountable decision makers might have some turnout effect on people who are content with the status quo. I, I, I think it could. It's, it's, it's really ends up being what the Democrats do with it. Um, I would be surprised if the Supreme Court justices overturn Roe v. Wade explicitly, I think what they'll do is pretend that they have not and okay the 15 day. Yes. Now, to be clear, Roe v. Wade sets a date. Casey sets a date, uh, I should say, a, a, a number of weeks in terms of viability. F uh, 15 weeks basically says we don't care about viability. That is the threshold that determines, that is the operative uh, point of Roe v. Wade and Casey, those two cases together. But they're going to claim that they're not overturning it, that they're just allowing, they're allowing states to um, set a different 
time period. We don't know. They're going to say something to the effect of like, this is my guess. They're going to say, we don't know where the, the cutoff should be, but we know that it is, um, that 15 weeks is okay. Because science is evolving. There's going to be some BS like that. They, they know that it would be politically difficult to just come out and say they're overturning Roe v. Wade. All right, number four, waiting for Carlson to denounce Ted Kaczynski's brother for turning him into the feds, says Jay <laughs> Shivone. Not a big flex given Republicans' recent disdain for the FBI. I've heard of loyalty. Prairie Fire Kowalski. Howdy, Farmer Sam. Vegan Vigiland and Marxist and our comrade crew. In my never-ending struggle to be an Alpha Cedar Chad male and not a Jimmy Beta cuck, I got my Pfizer booster 10 minutes ago. Now I'm all set for the big live show. Going to be a fun drive to Boston with my friend in Minnesota. That's a huge Bruins fan. Left his poggers. Oh, very excited to see you there. We got to figure out how we... We may, may do a, like a call out or something like that. I-5. Classic COVID symptoms. According to Donald Trump, you feel sweaty and obese. Walls are closing in. Your face turns bright orange and you have the hots for your daughter. Hey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Michael from Bavaria. If uh, uh, Arambe had a coconut cannon, he'd still be alive. Can you do an interview on the sand crisis, i.e. with Kieran Pereira? There's a sand crisis? Ah, oh, man. Jin Zoab, uh, the, the, the actual three silos. Skilled worker, rich, and can leave. Learn to use a gun and start a gang. Keep smoking that ho hopium as Republican minority rule is made permanent. Oh, I see what you're saying, yeah. Juicy, y'all's lack of Wayne World quote knowledge is totally awesome. Not Illuminati kids. It was pretty long ago, so I wanted to check. It, uh, I wanted to check. Did Tucker and Fox News have any criticisms on how Cuomo was handling COVID in New York? I'm sure. And the final I am of the day. <laughs> From the Majority Report, wardrobe coordinator, I never knew Jason Whitlock was such an ardent defender of himbo rights. <laughs> Matt, Bradley, Emma, great job today. Emma's here tomorrow. Bye-bye. It might take a strength like I to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm going to get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught